kia he akeana, te atakura, he teo, he huka, he haupu, te hei mauri ora. Morena everybody, um, welcome to our second uh, Environment and Climate Change Committee. Um, we, oh, so first of all, we are just obviously um, some sad news in the environmental uh, world and in Aotearoa. We're going to just um, have some quick acknowledgements followed by a minute of silence for Jeanette Fitzsimons and Sir Rob uh, Fenwick, who've recently passed away. And the Mayor would uh, like to lead both of those acknowledgements. We'll acknowledge Jeanette first. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. And it is, what struck me about Jeanette was that she always focused on the issue and never the person. And even in times in, in Parliament when she was attacked personally as, you know, having crazy ideas and uh, being out of touch with reality, she never responded. She focused on what she believed in. She was consistent in what she believed in. And it came from the heart and she lived her values. And uh, I think we owe her an immense debt. And as parliamentarians acknowledged uh, following her death uh, last week, uh, she did win respect from all sides of the House, uh, notwithstanding the fact that she was ahead of her time in many of the things that she was pushing in Parliament long before either Parliament or people were ready to accept it. Sir Rob Fenwick I knew originally from his time as Chair of Antarctica New Zealand, and as such he had a very clear idea of what the impact of uh, climate change was going to be on the Antarctic and then what the impact of that change would be for the whole of the world. Sir Robert uh, brought with him a, a very strong background in business, so it was, it was very much harder for people to dismiss what Rob said about the environment because he came from it from the perspective of somebody who had been a, a successful chief executive and business entrepreneur. Uh, but he fought consistently for a more sustainable environment. And both of these people uh, leave a legacy that any one of us around this table would be very proud to have uh, <clears throat> at, uh, at the point that we, we left the political scene. Um, they, they both made a real difference in how we look at the world. They moved us forward <clears throat> and they made a commitment to future generations of New Zealanders, and we should give, uh, we should pay tribute to them and honour them on this occasion. Uh, Sir Rob, uh, Jeanette, uh, Haere, Haere, Haere Atura, Moi Mai, Moi Mai, Moi Mai. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good. Uh, thank you, Mayor Goff. Would anyone? Oh, Councillor Fletcher. This is indeed a very sad day. Um, I, like the Mayor, had the great privilege of working with Jeanette Fitzsimons in Parliament. Um, I was chairing the Transport and Environment Committee at the time, and she was just such a lovely, wise, kind person. I, I, we all agree the, the vision that she had. Um, it's been amply demonstrated uh, in the calmness and, and the approach that, that she's taken in socialising issues that to some it was an anathema. But I think with Jeanette I have heard little of just what a wonderful woman she was, what a, what a kind person, what a thoughtful person. Um, and I'm, I'm saddened to hear that, that she has passed. Um, but with Sir Rob, um, going back to a family friendship um, from my childhood, um, Rob was there. He was the one championing treaty settlements long before it was fashionable. He was the one that invested in my FM, and, and he, did, he did so many things, whether it was Living Earth or all the many businesses that the Mayor has alluded to. Um, I worked very, very closely with him and recruited him as actually chair of the Motutapu Restoration Trust at the time that uh, the late Jim Holdaway needed to stand down because he had conflict uh, within the Conservation Board. 
and Rob uh, was chair with us through from 1998 through to 2001 from memory. And even then when he stepped aside, um, he remained as a guardian. And I spoke to him as recently as last week, seeking his wise counsel and his uh, understanding of the way in which as we, we, we confront, confront really difficult issues, um, that it's just gonna take cool heads and just calmness um, as we progressively move forward. So I, at a very personal level, I, I will really miss Rob. He was an outstanding chair with us. He was a, a lovely person to work with and he had a great sense of humor and could be quite wicked. But I, I think we have lost two very fine New Zealanders today and I think it's highly appropriate, Mr. Chairman, that you are having us pause to acknowledge two very great people. We have lost two great Totara, and I, I feel we are the lesser for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Fletcher. Would anyone else like to speak? Okay, thank you. We'll just stand for a minute of silence. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Right, so apologies. We have apologies from Councillor Fesso Collins for absence on family business. Um, we have Councillor Chris Darby. He's here, so then that's fine. And we have Councillor uh, Shane Henderson for early departure. Oh. And also Councillor Fletcher for early departure. Thank you. Can I please have a mover for the apologies? Yeah. Councillor Simpson, seconded by Councillor Casey. All those in favour? Aye. And against and carried. We have an overture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, declarations of interest. <laughs> oh. Councillor um. Coombe. Mr Chair, I'd just like to declare an interest that I was a trustee of Greylin 2030, one of the public forum items. And it, I was, yeah. Thank you, Councillor. Any other declarations? Thank you. I don't have to move, do I? No. Confirmation of minutes from the 28th of November. Could I please have a mover for those? Councillor Simpson, seconder. Yep. Councillor Casey, thank you. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Perfect. Any petitions? There are none. Public input. We have Brigitte first. Thank you. If you just come up to the table and, um, oh, and D Dr. Grant. Okay. So was it? Is it uh, two separate presentations? Cool, thank you. And if you just, when you're speaking, there's a talk button, and when you're not speaking, if you just um, turn it off, so. Sounds good. You just have uh, five minutes for the presentation, and then we'll have some questions. We will ding you uh, with a little bell at five minutes, um, just so you know, and then if you just round up um, to an appropriate time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kia ora, um, Mr Chair and Councillors. It's an honour to be here today to be um, presenting to you about Guadalupe 2030, which is a, a transition town, uh, part of an international movement. It was started in 2008 in Council of Pipakum. Actually, it was a, um, started this um, organisation as well, which is really fantastic. Um, in um, 2008, <clears throat> we celebrated our 10th anniversary and published a little book 
um, which was also supported by Vatimata Council, uh, Vatimata Local Board. Um, so I might as well go into the slide. Um, this uh, little book is also available on the internet when you go through the um, international transition town. Um, a little bit about the organization to start with. Um, there is the trust and uh, many groups came out of this uh, and most of them are now self-governed and have their own um, board. <clears throat> As you can also see, there's very much like a leaning towards the right about waste. So we have many organizations and many groups that um, are concerned about waste minimization. We've done, um, as you can see also in the book, if you um, happen to be able to read this, um, is that we um, have many activities and um, yeah, projects that concern themselves with waste mineralization, in particular with plastic. So today I would like to um, share with you a new project that we are currently preparing, which is called the CUP project. And it really concerns itself, um, uh, is focused on the elimination of single-use cups. And it's a, a community-led project, uh, working with resources that are already available. So we are engaging uh, community groups, schools, and local cafes in Guaylin, collect and uh, collecting um, jars that have the right size for New Zealand standard coffees. <laughs> uh, and then making them into little cups like these. This is a, <laughs> a small coffee, this is a medium coffee. So uh, yeah, and we just had a barista training to teach people how to do this. And it's just really awesome. So they are koha cups. We give them away to people. But the idea is really um, to start a conversation over a cup of coffee about climate change. So that's what we're inviting. Um, let's get to the next slide. Um, yeah, so um, the approach is an eight-week feasibility study. The launch is on the 22nd of March, which is Sunday week, um, at the Guaranian Farmers Market. And we are, um, yeah, six participating cafes will be delivered, those beautiful cups, and people will start um, hopefully using them. And it's a um, recycling and a, a circular system. So we are expecting people to bring them back. They get cleaned by the cafe and they receive a clean jar, uh, but they can keep that little uh, cup holder or heat band. Mm. Uh, we also offer workshops. Workshops uh, during this eight week period, because it's not only about repurposing and upcycling, it's also about reskilling, upskilling people. <clears throat> so we're teaching people how to crochet, how to sew, you know, so, and a lot of young people are really interested in learning these skills. So it's a lot of working on multiple levels, really. Uh, we will also um, write a report, so we collect data from the um, cafes to see, you know, what is a, what is a single-use uh, cup use, and then koha cups, return koha cups, and keep cups. So we'll have some data to present and write the report, and would like to deliver the report to you as well and various other organizations, and hopefully the Ministry of the, for the Environment as well, <laughs> and just start a conversation. Uh, then um, the whole um, background of this to run a feasibility study is the idea of introducing, uh, creating a template which can be then adopted by other organizations and other uh, communities. And we've already uh, gained quite a bit of interest you know, for other people to uh, take this on. Um, and that's the exciting part, I think, you know. So, uh, so at the moment, we are just working with four schools, making these, and the community as well. And um, they take a little bit of time, but, you know, this is the idea also. We care about, you know, we care about the environment, we care about you, and we give this to you, so please treat it well. You know, so this is all about behaviour change, really. That's another background in this, you know. So just introducing something that um, people enjoy, they can get involved, you know, in any, any way they wish, um, and then change their practices. Mm. Uh, so we create a map, and it's going to be like an app. So, oopsie too. What is that? Is that five minutes? Yep. Just, oh. you, you don't have to rush, you can That's just um, <laughs> yeah. round That's up. very quick. So uh, basically saying, you know, this is the launch and, and we have a map, you know, where we can add if cafes or schools or other organisations um, uh, take part in it. And uh, we really, we really thank you, you know, for this opportunity to let you know about this. Um, yeah, 
So thank you very much. <laughs> Would you like me to pass this one in this direction? You can yeah, pass okay. that one in this direction. That's a great idea. <laughs> cool, that's fantastic. Thank you very much, Brigitte. Mm -hmm. um, I think first question we have is from Councillor Stewart. Thank you. Um, I have got a question, but I want to say that is a wonderful initiative. But I just wonder whether the timing isn't really, really good at the moment because of the coronavirus. Mm. Um, I just note um, <coughs> that a lot of cafes around the country are no longer accepting reusable cups due to coronavirus fears. So I'm just wondering whether your promotion, it might be better to, to leave it for a little bit later and wait until we get through this coronavirus before you start, you know, I just, you know, because I think it is a wonderful, it's a wonderful initiative. I think it's really a wonderful initiative, but like all things, um, timing is, is, everything. is everything. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, we've been, we've been thinking about it as well, yes, you know, so, um, and I just uh, saw a, um, from the Ministry of um, uh, health spokesperson saying that it's fine to accept keep cups so that was a release yesterday so that's fine and also as i mentioned um the person who will return the cup uh, will, will, this will get sterilized and they'll receive a new one a fresh one which is sterilized by the cafe so that's how we Just try at, to work at, at the moment they're not accepting them so yeah mcdonald's is not and starbucks aren't yeah. that's right yeah. mm -hmm. thank you thank you Thank you. Uh, Councillor Henderson. Thanks, uh, Mr Chair. Um, yeah, just to commend you guys, uh, it's brilliant. Any, any project that allows people to reflect upon their climate impacts is a great thing. Um, what are the, how do we evaluate success with this? How do, how do we come back in a year and, and see that they are being reused? Well, that's what, what I mentioned. We keep statistics, you know, each cafe will um, record, you know, like every week, you know, how many cups have been used and reused. Mm. Yeah, and returned, exactly. Mm. Yeah. And we have three follow-ups, three months follow-ups as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I don't think there are any other... Oh, Councillor Simpson. So do individuals keep the outside and just... The, because the outside is... is um, you the know, heat band or the cup holder. Yeah. Mm. So does an individual keep that bit? You wouldn't, because how does that get clean, keep washed and cleaned? Well, they can wash this themselves. Oh, okay. So that's so you, you actually keep your own bit, or do you do you pull that back as well? Sorry. So you keep, when you when you keep your when you return yeah. it yeah. and it gets sterilised, do you return the outside that you both things, or do you keep the outside for yourself? You keep this, and 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 then your cup can be placed in that. Right. Okay. Mm. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any last questions, members? Perfect. Uh, Pippa, would you like to move? Now, uh, thank you very much. I think that's a, you know, very tangible, um, clear thing, uh, project about reducing waste. But I also love that you're thinking wider. That it can be something, uh, bite sizable that other communities can pick up without having to do all the, the background work and everything. So that's, uh, yeah, very sustainable approach. So thank you very much for coming in, and thanks for your emails. And sorry, I can't make the twenty second. But hopefully, if other members of the committee are around, um, that they will try and uh, come and partake in the celebration. So thank you very much. Thank you. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. <laughs> thank you. On to the Waitamata Low Carbon Network. All oh, right. And just before we've got uh, a photographer from Stuff, just if you thought, uh, if you're wondering what was going on, but um, Suad has just let me know to let you know. That is who is taking photos, so thank you. Thank you. Cool. And great. Yeah. Kia ora koutou. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Chair, for the opportunity to, to speak uh, today. Uh, and thank you, councillors, for that opportunity as well. So I'm, I'm going to speak um, in support of Te uh, Tautauriki A Tafari, um, your climate action framework, and commend you all on having, uh, in your offices, on having this being brought back quite early in the year. I know that sometimes these documents can take a while to process, and they must have been working very hard over summer to bring all of this uh, to you back. So I really commend you on moving this through as quickly as possible. 
I just wanted to highlight some of the kind of feedback um, that you're getting uh, from the, the consultation that you've done um, and just and, and reinforce, I suppose, that and, and commend you for uh, taking as strong as actions as you can. And I think the, the project that we just looked at about Keep, keep Cups, you're right, Councillor Henderson, you know, sometimes climate change is this, this huge thing out there and what can I do, how can I connect with it, what does it mean to me? Sometimes bringing it back as simple as uh, we all love a coffee, how can we be more sustainable about the way we have our coffee, how can we make our coffee cups uh, and recycle materials is kind of part of the thinking, uh, the circular economy thinking, those things which can come right back down to me as an individual making some choices and doing something that's positive in that regard. Um, so that's why we wanted to kind of share that with you as well today. In terms of um, the, the uh, uh, summary documents and the consultation that you've received, uh, we were involved um, quite a bit in um, the groups and various organisations, particularly at a community level, uh, and engage in the document and provide consultation, um, particularly the Auckland University Equal Justice Project. They apologise they couldn't be here today. Um, we're really excited to be involved in, in the work that you do and the thinking that you do uh, at the level of, of input. Um, and they're really pleased with the, the kind of feedback and that it reflects a lot of the concerns that they raised. So what are some of those sort of key theme feedbacks? Well, I think the main one that came through is Climate change has become so important to us that we do need to treat it with the, with the real urgency that it requires. And there's a reflection on, of that in the consultation, but it's something you've got to carry forward into this document and probably into, I'd suggest, all of your work. We also need to scale up actions and commend uh, the, the budget in terms of its focus on EV, its focus on um, moving um, from progressing uh, buses away from diesel to electric, uh, to growing more trees, uh, to doing some things that I suppose are the, the low-hanging fruit that we can really immediately get into. Um, but there must be a lot more out there. And we really encourage your officers as you travel through the annual budget process to go, what other low-hanging fruit can we really grab hold of and demonstrate scale and urgency to this problem um, with immediacy? Part of that was also linking in bolder and more targeted um, and accelerated targets. So often with these plans, they're easy to write, uh, they're easy to kind of put some targets in that are loose, but unless you are measuring your progress, you won't know whether you're keeping us to 1.5 degrees. So you've got to focus a lot more, I think, in this document on how do we monitor, how do we create some really solid targets and you know, graduate those over two, three, five, ten years so we get to where we need to be as quickly as possible. I think the partnerships theme came through really strongly as well, and, and again, why we're here is um, partnering at all levels um, across the city uh, in terms of climate change work, all communities, Māori, Pacifica, and, and there's a real emphasis in this document on those communities, and that came through really strongly. You not need to keep those organisations, groups, and people really involved as you take this forward. But probably where the key partnership, um, if it needs to be, uh, is central government. And at Auckland Council, frankly, in terms of local government across New Zealand, is uniquely placed to have those serious conversations one-on-one -on -one with the government about moving as quickly as possible uh, down this climate change path. So I think your own advocacy, your ability as a council to really kind of step up and be at that level of central government needs to come through much more strongly uh, in terms of the feedback that you've been given. Um, the other, I think, real difficulty about climate change um, is it affects everything. Uh, it's all pervasive. Almost everything we do has an impact. Has um, some, uh, uh, So the integrated thinking needs to happen more. The um, systems thinking, the way in which behaviour over here affects behaviour over here needs to come through that document. And, and finally, I think another part of it is sometimes that's easier to do yourselves. So sometimes it's hard to get a whole community or whole region to think in an integrated systems way. But actually, if you look inside your own organisation, your own the Auckland Council itself um, and the CCOs, that's where you can get that thinking happening far more rapidly because effectively you control it. So getting the CCOs to step up in terms of their corporate thinking about the way their, their staff operate, uh, the way in which their systems work, the way in which they engage with climate change, and I think this document offers an opportunity to really push that a lot harder than perhaps it has at the moment. And finally, transport. Um, it, it, excuse me, just for another 30 seconds. Um, 
Transport is where you can make a lot of difference. It's the sort of um, area where you have a lot, you know, more control than other areas. Um, but if we're going to get to our targets, we need to be really pulling down that transport um, emissions profile in a decade. We need to get to zero transport emissions really in a decade to make any sort of difference in terms of long term. Finally, the other thing I think uh, just like to finish on and, and recommend to you is you declared a climate emergency and we commended that uh, and, and attended that, that meeting uh, that Penny Hulse chaired. It was a fantastic meeting, a lot of energy, a lot of really good spirit and, and I'd say a, a very serious declaration that you all uh, adopted. I think you need to rename this document as it travels through to being the climate emergency plan. Keep that word emergency in there. That's what we're in. It may feel like it's 10, 20 years off, but actually when you look at the way in which Northland is now coping with hardly any water, the way in which we've, we've been largely in drought, the way in which Australia has suffered over summer, we are in the crisis, we're in the emergency. So I don't think it's wrong for you to relabel this as an emergency plan in that context. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you for your time, councillors. Sure, Ora. Thank you, Dr Grant. Does anyone have any um, questions? Sorry, Member Wilson. Uh, thank you. It's not a question as such as commentary in, in, in the affirmative as in uh, all the points that you hit. Uh, just over five minutes were absolutely what was needed to be heard as we start our meeting. The points that I picked up, especially in around measurement, uh, partnerships that you identified, uh, central government um, specifically, I'm, I'm talking about the ones that I'm specifically interested. I like the way that you talked about the integration, which is going to be key, and the systems thinking, which I also p picked up. Um, and then in the naming of it all, um, so there isn't anything there that I um, don't think is a good way forward for us all, and I appreciate very much that your thoughts can be brought in such a... You know, this meeting will be a long meeting, but the way you brought those all together was very, very well done. Appreciate that. Any other questions? Oh, we're very quiet today. Okay. <laughs> Never say that. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, would someone like to move re uh, receiving the report? Councillor Bartley, Councillor Casey, second, or did you? And uh, all those in favour, everyone? Aye. Against? No. Perfect. Thank you very much. And have a great day. You're welcome to stay for as long or as little as you'd like, but you're happy to um, have you here. So thank you. Next up, we have local board input. And as far as I know, there is still no local board input today. So thank you. No extraordinary items that I know of. No. Thank you. And then straight to item eight, we have Alec, Sarah, Matthew. Cool. And if everyone could just um, introduce themselves as they uh, start speaking again. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. I'll just, um, yes. I would just like to move the recommendations and I have made some slight changes um, to those, but I will talk about that at the time and Councillor Coombe would like to second those. Um, just to have them on the table. We'll go through the presentation and then we'll discuss after. Thank you. Tēnā uh, koe, Chair. Tēnā koutou katoa. Um, hopefully you all know me by now, Alec Tang, Acting Chief Sustainability Officer. Um, to my right, I have Sarah Anderson, who you'll increasingly know, who leads the Climate Action Plan Development, and Matthew Blakey, who is our lead on climate mitigation, so the emissions reduction side. Um, so just to give a bit of context, the focus of today is really to highlight the results of consultation and to outline those proposed structural changes in response to that feedback we've received. Um, before I go into that, though, I just wanted to take the opportunity. Um, we've had some really positive feedback about the response rate from Māori, Pacifica and youth. Um, so Sarah will talk a little bit more about this shortly. But I wanted to acknowledge the work of the Rangatahi Ropu groups like Parakore, Kitanaki, Te Ohumara, Rangatahi, Te Arafatu, Kawai Catalyst, Generation Zero, in driving that youth response, and similarly um, activations that have been led by Manafanua Kaiteki Forum alongside Hapai Te Hodua, Te Oroa Manako, Te Kotahi Atamaki. Um, that was key to that response, and I think talks to the point about partnerships in delivering this action. Um, so we have 
a short presentation. I'm conscious that we've already had three workshops over the past few weeks with members to go through the content. Appreciate that we have covered a lot of ground, um, which reflects the amount of work that the team's put in um, to underpin those proposed changes since consultations closed. Um, things like updating the modeling, which you've seen, testing approaches, those additional um, components, testing costing actions. But we want to try and keep this presentation pretty high, largely for those members who weren't able to attend those workshops. Um, so the first thing I need to do, would like to do, um, is to reiterate where we are in the process of developing our climate response. Um, this committee paper, um, the resolutions in front of you, focus on those structural changes to the plan um, in response to feedback. Um, just want to really stress that this isn't the full text of the climate plan. Um, I understand some members could be concerned by the level of detail in the committee report. Um, it's purely because we haven't brought that level of detail committee yet. Um, we're seeking endorsement of those structural changes um, that will allow us to finalise that plan text um, and also the digital skeleton, um, which we'll bring forward through April, May. You'll see there highlighted April workshop um, is where we'll sit um, and talk through that detailed content. Um, once we have that endorsement in May, um, obviously we'll place that text into the digital plan with a view to launching later on this year. Um, the other thing just to note, it's important to recognise that the key drive for these timelines is so that the climate plan and the actions detailed within it um, can inform the LTP. And so in parallel to finalising the plan, we're working on potential funding packages for inclusion in the LTP um, that delivers on Council's contribution to um, those actions as we were directed by Council to do last year. So hopefully that makes clear <coughs> what today's about and what we're looking to do um, through these committee resolutions. Um, I'll carry on to a little bit about what we're working towards, which I think talks a little bit to what Grant was um, mentioning. Sierra will then talk a little bit through the what we heard from consultation and the People's Perception Survey, and then Sierra and Matt will talk through those proposed structural changes. Um, so at a really high level, and members would have seen this last week, um, what we're working towards is um, a document, um, the framework or plan, um, which sets the direction, sets the vision, highlights those priorities for action, um, and has longevity. Um, so we don't want to be coming back to committee and updating it um, regularly. That is what this implement implementation section within the plan will do. Um, that will highlight the roles, responsibilities, talk about partnering and targets, um, as, as, um, um, as, as was mentioned earlier, um, and will form that basis of regular monitoring. That is the bit that will be updated annually. It will need to be updated. As we know, um, climate change is happening quicker than we potentially have thought, so that need for dynamism is critical in, in our response, our regional response. Obviously, the plan then informs a long-term plan. Um, as I talked about costs, climate action, um, and with that three-year minimum review. So just again to reiterate where we are in this process, um, we are here today looking at those structural changes to the plan. Um, next, we'll look at the text in detail through those April workshops with a view to adoption in May. Um, that implementation section as part of the plan will be developed in parallel, and again, we'll bring that to you in April, again, with a view to adopting the approach in May. Um, and then the long-term plan, obviously, process um, carries on from June. That is everything from me so far, so I'll hand over to Sarah. Tēnā katoa. Um, I was just, as Alex said, obviously, there's been a lot of workshops over the past few weeks, so we were just going to do quite a high-level summary of some of those slides. Um, so I was just going to talk a bit about the consultation responses and just some highlights from the People's Perception Survey. But just a lot of you are very familiar with this slide now. We've shown it quite a lot. Um, but just really to reiterate, that consultation draft that went out in July was actually informed by around 600 Aucklanders. There was a huge amount of work and engagement that went into it and a lot of kind of modelling, evidence building, international best practice. And so a lot of the feedback was actually supporting many of the actions coming through. And so that's why we're talking about structural changes rather than detail. So what we did with regards to the public consultation, it ran from 17th of July to 30th of September. 
in recognition of disproportionate impacts and also people who most engaged with consultation, we did a range of targeted engagement as well to ensure that all of the right voices were represented. So we did targeted engagement with Maori, with youth and with Pacific peoples. We went out to 17 markets across the region, recognising it's better to go to where people are rather than necessarily expect people to come to you. Um, held, went to a number of events and tied in with Auckland conversations, panel discussions, workshops, and we also benefited from quite a lot of media, particularly relating to the school strike from climate. And that resulted in nearly 3,000 responses, um, both from individuals and also organisations were represented mm -hmm. from community groups through to big business such as New Zealand Steel. 21% of respondents were in the 15 to 24 age group and 25% of respondents were from Māori, which I think demonstrates the success of that targeted engagement. So in a nutshell, from the responses, we found that 91% of respondents supported or partially supported the direction that we were taking. 79% thought there was a very strong role for Auckland Council and Auckland Council should facilitate. 93% supported or partially supported the key moves, and 89% thought it would drive business action. Those were the four key questions that we asked through the consultation. And as Grant talked about previously, there were some key themes that emerged from those consultation responses. Very much, we need to talk to urgency and the scale of action that's needed to deliver this. People felt there was a need for a stronger emissions story and targets to be much clearer as to how our actions will actually deliver emissions reductions. Greater clarity on the adaptation approach, it was felt that was a little light in the previous framework. Communication engagement being a real priority throughout all of the um, development of the plan and how we implement it going forward. Better understanding of the risks to the region, the need for a strong Māori voice, not just within individual key moves, but across the document. There was a lot of feedback that talked about equity um, on an intergenerational level and in general as well, and that needed a much stronger focus. Um, greater alignment of key moves, there was some confusion and crossover. What is council family action and leadership? How do we enable local leadership and partnerships coming through really strongly? How do we monitor? How do we evaluate? And just to really reiterate, transport was the most cited across feedback. And as we spoke about, there was targeted Māori engagement led by Māori organisations and mana whenua, which resulted in that 25% response to the consultation. And there are a number of overarching themes came through around resilience, educating whānau, regenerative practices, recognising rights and interests, adaptability and wellbeing, and the need for a very holistic approach in how we address this and greater connection to knowledge and learning. So I was going to briefly touch on the public perception survey. As you know from consultations, it's self-selecting people who feed back on consultations. So we also went out to 2,000 Aucklanders, demographically representative, to gather public perceptions and feedback on the framework. So I just pulled out a couple of kind of very high level pieces of information here. You've had the report as an annex, obviously. So three in four Aucklanders believe that human activity is changing the climate. One in three express a high level of concern about the impact of climate change on Auckland, and 46% express moderate concern. There is widespread recognition that we must make changes, and 42% see a need for radical change. And most Aucklanders are willing to change their lifestyle to ensure we meet our commitments, with two in five willing to make radical change. I should caveat at this stage, we were just starting the conversation about what radical change means, and so we'll be discussing that a lot more as we go through towards the LTP. Aucklanders see a key role for Auckland Council to take climate action. As we saw in the consultation responses, those are really reinforced here. And with over half of Aucklanders seeing, Auckland Council has a more critical role in delivering climate action. So we were just going to run through at a high level the proposed structural updates. Obviously, over the work workshops over the past few weeks, we've gone into a lot more detail around these. 
But in a nutshell, to address the feedback, there was a strong feeling of a need for greater clarity as to how we're going to address our climate goals. And so we're proposing there are three pillars that really underpin the actions that we're taking and what we need to achieve. And those flow into the eight priorities rather than 11 key moves. And we'll talk a lot more about these as we go through the presentation. So I should say there's around 50 actions that sit underneath these priorities, but a much stronger alignment between what are our priorities and how do they deliver against our foundations and our goals. So the first of the pillars being very much our story. If we don't take a place-based approach and really have that as the foundation of what we're doing, everything else needs to flow from that. The second being mitigation around reducing our emissions and the third being how we prepare for change. So just briefly to talk to the first foundational of those, much of this draws through from the framework and the learning we've done to date, but in recognition of a lot of the work that's happened since then, particularly with regards to Te'oro Atomaki and the well-being, this is still very much a work in progress, I should say, and much more discussion to be had. But much more about how we learn and interweave Maori principles and bringing through what was in a key move, much more foundational to the plan overall and also the work of Rangatahi sitting at this level as a foundational area. As we talked about, equity is a key priority for a lot of people, and it, came, it was fed back across respondents. We need a much stronger focus on this. So again, it's bringing that up front and center. What is it, why is it important, and how will we ensure we're addressing equity? Our climate emergency, obviously that needs to be front and center as well. And also our work to date and the commitments we've made so far. The other part of this is really recognising all of the feedback that talks about partnerships and how important partnerships are to delivery of our climate goals. So the future iteration we are proposing has much greater clarity on roles in delivery and how people need to work together going forward and also how we develop the plan in partnership. So I'll hand over to Matt at this point. Tene koutou katoa. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about the second pillar, uh, as Sarah has outlined, which is focused on mitigation. So in terms of reducing our emissions, um, you will see here the, the circles, the white circles represent uh, what was in the framework that went out for consultation, with the pink circles being what we are proposing as additional changes. So if I talk through <laughs> each of those, um, starting at the top, it's important that we articulate our emissions profile in terms of the emission profile of the Auckland region. Um, this is based on the greenhouse gas inventory that our research and evaluation unit produce on an annual basis um, and identifies the current emissions by sector. It's important that we understand this in order to act appropriately um, and identify our material impacts. So understanding our emissions by sector and also the sources of those emissions within each sector. Um, we will also be clearly identifying our business as usual projection. It is important that we understand where we are heading without additional climate action. So what is our business as usual projection out to 2050? Again, this has been produced by our research and evaluation unit. Um, we had a decarbonisation pathway to 2050 outlined in the framework that went out for consultation. Um, this is based on modelling that was produced. We've done further modelling work um, to understand how this pathway to 2050 can change under different um, scenarios that we've modelled. We've modelled the impact, um, sorry, modelled climate action across sectors. And importantly, we've modelled a more ambitious pathway. So this is based on consultation feedback, and it's also based on further um, research and work we've done based on um, scientific um, evidence around the need to decarbonise more rapidly to 2030 in particular, which brings me on to the, um, the pink bowl next to it, which is a proposed ambitious interim target of 50% emissions reduction by 2030. This was not in the previous framework. This is um, a structural change um, relating to the level of ambition and the scale of emissions reduction that is required by 2030. We have modeled this across sectors to understand which sectors um, um, would need to deliver climate action in order to hit this target. Um, so we've modelled that decarbonisation pathway and we've also developed a carbon budget uh, for Auckland. This is based on Auckland delivering its fair share 
of the global carbon budget in order to stay within that 1.5 degree temperature threshold. So that's a carbon budget in terms of our cumulative emissions out to 2050. Um, so I wanted to highlight that to you. Um, the bottom row you can see there, we will also be um, including new material on production and, and consumption emissions. Production emissions are the emissions that we produce within the Auckland region, the emissions that we um, measure through our emissions inventory. Consumption emissions are also an important part of the picture. They are the emissions that are produced through the goods and services that we consume. So emissions that might um, might be produced outside of the Auckland region, for example, through the production of construction materials or through the production of um, food or transportation of food um, and other goods that we consume. So we are including a section on that, acknowledging that, but also um, recognising that a number of the actions within the updated plan do relate to consumption emissions, such as the life cycle emissions of um, infrastructure, looking at construction materials, looking at community um, community climate action and the decisions we make through behaviour change. And so that brings me on to um, what can I do? It's important that we have in the plan a section that points people towards what they can do in terms of individual climate action. We heard a good example this morning from Gray Lynn. We also have um, many existing and established schemes within council and um, the Live Lightly programme, the Future Fit programme, that we can point people towards so they can take individual climate action, recognising that this is important, although the plan is focused at a systemic level, um, looking at integrated systemic climate change action. So the third pillar is focused on adaptation, preparing for change. Um, again, the white circles represent what was in the, the previous framework that went out for consultation. We have climate projections for the Auckland region produced by NIWA. This is the evidence base that we are using to inform our, um, our decisions and our, um, our work on climate action. We've done further work to identify the climate risks to Auckland as a result of those climate projections. So these are the risks to Auckland as a result of climate change impacts. Um, this again was produced by our research and evaluation unit. So including that in terms of understanding our climate change risk assessment. And then um, a new addition in terms of the structural changes is planning for 3.5 degrees of warming. So this is taking a precautionary approach. And of course, this is not where we want to end up. We want to take significant climate action so that we don't end up there. Um, but currently, um, globally, the BAU projection is for us to hit 3.5 degrees of warming. So this highlights both the need to adapt, but also the need to take significant climate action to avoid that scenario at a global level. Um, we are proposing dynamic adaptive policy pathways as an approach to address this. Um, we, we spoke about this previously in the workshops. Um, this is largely focused on making the right decision at the right time to ensure that um, we um, leave ourselves open to future adaptation pathways, um, for example, around our built environment and infrastructure. And we will be including examples in the plan from water care and our coastal work as well. Uh, at the bottom there, you'll see, what do I need to know? Um, this is an important addition. We're providing people with a lot of information, both um, people and businesses through the plan. So pointing towards um, what people need to know in terms of our priorities. So pointing towards existing work, such as the Auckland Emergency Management Hazard Viewer and our work on flood risk, so that people can see further information and are linked to it. I'll just pause for a second and just um, what I will update you all better when the presentation is finished is discussions I've had with IMSB and Member Wilson and Member Wilcox today and yesterday and with Alec is fine with us so Sarah and Matthew might not know all the details yet but I am proposing that instead of three pillars that the over, there will be an overarching tamaki response and then there will be two core drivers which will be mitigation and adaptation that is from feedback um, and discussion with IMSB, but I also know that that is what the team <coughs> want, want the process to be, but we're just going to make it very clear that that is what the process is and very visual and very that the Tamaki response drives those back and forth. So just um, for the, um, uh, not everyone will know that around the table, can flesh it out a bit more after the presentation, but just thought this um, staff wouldn't have had time this morning to 
maybe update on, on what that is. But that's in the public agenda, what you've just presented. But I'm going to discuss why I'm wanting to those changes. So just thank you. And then you can carry on. Thanks. So moving on to the priorities in the plan, um, the first thing to note in terms of proposed changes, uh, you may be familiar with the key moves that were articulated in the framework. There were 11 key moves. We are proposing that the 11 key moves become eight priorities. So there's a change in terminology and also a change in number to be aware of. Um, the reason for that is, um, is illustrated there on the screen. So we had a key move one relating to foundational action. The proposal is for the foundational actions and these largely related to governance, to decision making and to research, for example, um, are embedded in other sections of the plan. So embedded in other priorities. Um, working from left to right, key move two becomes priority one. Natural environment stays as it is, stays as it was. I'm sorry. Um, key move three and key move four um, addressed. Firstly, key move three, new developments, and key move four being existing developments. So, in terms of new development buildings, infrastructure, and then existing buildings and places, through the feedback, through the consultation process, um, there was. A number of points made around how this was slightly confusing to some people as they saw it as one um, area in terms of the built environment. So we're proposing that these are combined into a built environment priority, but also acknowledging that there are different stakeholders, different levers, different financial mechanisms in place around new and existing um, built environment assets. So we will be addressing those separately through the actions, but bringing them together under one priority. Transport um, being a key theme remains as transport. The economy goes into the economy priority. Community is becoming, um, the proposal is for it to become community and coast, recognizing that there are um, coastal communities that will be impacted significantly by climate change um, and bringing a further emphasis on coast in terms of coast being the arena where a lot of climate impacts will, will play out and also recognizing the work that's already ongoing. Uh, te Pua Waitanga o Te Tangata, um, relating to um, Māori and Māori outcomes, Te Ao Māori within the plan is remaining. Um, rangatahi, in terms of our focus on rangatahi, Māori and Pacifica youth, is the proposal is it for it to be embedded in um, the foundational sections, the foundational actions within the priorities. The reason for this is that it is um, focused on how we do things. So it's not just about how we do things in isolation, it's how we do things across all of those priorities. Um, energy, a slight wording tweak. The, the proposal is for it to become energy and industry, recognizing that a significant um, proportion of our emissions is attributable to industry in terms of process heat for manufacturing, as an example. And then key move 11, food to remain as a food priority. Um, those are the structural changes in terms of the key moves becoming priorities. Um, nothing will be lost. They will just be um, reformatted um, based on the feedback we've received and based on making the plan more accessible in terms of having eight priorities. For every priority, the proposed structure is to clearly outline what it is or what is it, um, a summary of the priority and what we are trying to achieve. Why is it a priority in terms of what is the impact and how does it align to the three pillars? Um, what will we do in terms of the actions identified and how they will be delivered? So in terms of the climate action to live, deliver on that priority. And also importantly, the sub actions that sit below the actions, the detail in terms of implementation, how we will do things. And then um, how will we know we've succeeded? And this has been mentioned um, today already, both in terms of um, Dr. Grant's public feedback, um, public impact, input, I should say, but also the comments through the consultation. Um, importantly, looking at monitoring and indicators. So how do we know that we're on track um, moving forward? So that will be articulated within the proposed structure. Um. So that, that concludes the formal presentation, highlighting some of the changes. Um, just to recap where we are in terms of bringing the, the formal text through in April, um, maybe just as a, as a quick point to re-emphasize what Councillor, what the Chair was saying, um, the intention with those three elements, those foundational elements, was obviously that um, 
as a Auckland climate response, we need it to be very much focused on what does the region need. Um, yes, we need to talk about mitigation, so reducing our emissions. Yes, we need to talk about adaptation. But those actions that we're focused on need to have that clear Tamaki, clear Auckland focus. Um, so the intention was always that they would talk to each other. Um, conversations that we've had is that how do we better represent that overarching Tamaki response? Um, and that's reflected in the updated resolution. Thank you. And Suada, just getting printouts of those updated resolutions that I'm myself and uh, the ch uh, Deputy Chair Afakum are proposing, just so you can see them. But first of all, we'll just um, go to questions. Yeah. Moment, Councillor Walker. Um, the workshops and one of the issues I raised around the priorities is they're almost categories because they cover virtually everything. <laughs> so without some explanation, um, it's, it's really the, the next level that indicates the priorities. I did also raise the issue around water, which is lacking there. And I probably don't need to bring to your attention that we have almost a national emergency around water across the North Island, which is categorised as a drought area. And uh, certainly across a number of other C40s, they would rate water as a priority. And I could substantiate this, Mr Chair, but I'm just putting to you as a question, why isn't water there? Because it's critical. Um, through the Chair, um, in terms of the priorities, those um, areas, those eight aspects are very much focused on Auckland's emissions profile, um, and ha hence that's why we've, we've landed on those as well as the I guess the risks and vulnerability side of things so that's what they are um, appreciate I think um, your point about what are the actions that we take in response to those that's where we'll get more of a, a focus there um, in terms of water um, agree water is a critical part of our response and that's why um, we're going to actually talk about that within the our Auckland uh, Tamaki response side of things so actually bringing it up as um, this is how and I suppose um, this is how climate change will will um, appear, if, if I put it that way. Um, so, so yes, we've got some stuff about water infrastructure in that kind of built environment side of things, but, and, and within the natural environment, there's uh, the whole kind of ecosystem green infrastructure side of things, but actually how that appears as a, um, a, a, a topic is really up, up there higher in the our Auckland Artamaki response. Okay, well, I, I guess in response, I just put to you that water as a concept and as a thing is something that people are very easy uh, able to identify with. Uh, water goes to flooding and inundation, stormwater, uh, wastewater, potable water, the embedded energy in water, and it's one of the few areas where through water care and healthy waters we actually exert a significant amount of control. So I'm just registering with you uh, something there that is lacking in, in my view. Um, so I just want to put that on the table. Um, I, I guess the other thing that I'd just raise, um, just by way of question, is obviously we don't have a lot of the detail here, but I'm assuming that we're going to have um, some, some really good aspirational uh, targets around renewable energy. Uh, for example, we could have a uh, target around water in terms of self-sufficiency for Auckland, as other cities do. So are we going to see those sort of aspirational targets in the in the plan and then as you point out milestones monitoring um, on both the short term and medium term so that we know that we're hitting them um through not uh, yes short answer you, uh, councillor casey questions yeah. uh, my question is probably a political question to the chair and but it does relate to former key move five which is now priority number something else it's the deliver clean, safe and equitable transport options. I think what, what, my, what my problem, I love this work, right? This work is great. You have unanimous support for it. But what I have a difficulty with is when we have to make a decision that relates to this in this chamber. Now, I'm going to give you two that relate to that key move or that priority. And, and it's to do with, one, the buses and two, the pedestrianisation of Queen Street. So we're, we're about to see possible question and the mayor can get it or you can get it Richard but I, I, I all the time you're talking I'm thinking about the actions we need to take and how we're not actually following through that wasn't a question okay. <laughs> 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 
Definitely. How, 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 how then do we do it? How do we translate these great words and those great priorities into actual actions by Auckland Transport? So I think it is a political question, and I think uh, throughout the next two months writing of the plan to show the actions, but it will take all of us individually and as a group to be harder, be stronger, make the hard and tough um, decisions with our CCOs and with uh, departments across council, or we need to be honest with the public that we will not reach targets or we will not do have action on climate change. So we, I do personally have a concern, if you're asking for a political answer, that we aren't doing that in a lot of areas. We are in a lot of areas, but we will need to all act and all be honest about what, where we're moving and where we're not moving. So thank you, Councillor Casey, but I think it's a question for all of us, not just me. So thank you. Councillor Bartley, question. Um, thank you, Mr Chair, um, through you. Thank you for all your work on this. Um, I wanted to ask about the consultation and whether there was feedback from, or submissions from the big players out there, um, the ones that we are going to need to partner with, did they, is there buy-in from them in terms of um, this plan, like central government, um, industry, agricultural sector, did they submit and have they bought into this plan in order for us to facilitate partnership, which is what the public have said they wanted us to play? Because I'm really concerned about the plan being seen as just council's plan when it should be seen as Auckland's plan. And the only way we're going to achieve real change is if all those big players buy into this plan and pay for it as well as us. Kia ora, Councillor. Um, I guess to, to answer that, um, um, yes, so specifically on the consultation, we had about 80 plus organisational responses, including some large industry energy providers, um, groups like New Zealand Book, Green Building Council, Forest and Bird and, and others. <laughs> um, the other thing to, to make note of, and it was that funnel diagram which Sarah highlighted, way back when we started this process, we convened a number of subject matter expert workshops, which actually led to the generation of the initial actions and that included businesses um, civil society um, the likes of wwf and, and others um, in that room so when we talk about the buy-in through that phase yes through that process um, if i'm honest um, our focus in the last few months has been processing feedback and getting to this point so now there is another need to go further out again and re-engage with those broader communities. The other thing I'd say, just in terms of business, is um, we are part of a Climate Leaders Coalition. Um, there's 100-ish um, large and small medium, uh, small businesses who have signed up to a similar target to, to what we've um, committed to, a one and a half degree um, halving our emissions um, target. And that includes the Z Energies, the Fonterras, the Fletchers, those large organizations. So if anything, from a business sense, we're probably catching up to them. Great question. Uh, Councillor Cooper. Thank you. And I apologise first because you were talking about the water before, but I kind of zoned out. Um, my issue is um, talking about in the adaptation space around things like extra water capacity for rural you know, we've gone through a big issue. And so does that sit in, will those, will those show the actions? And you've also got the dynamic adaptive policies because we'll have to change a lot of policies to allow a lot of the things we need to do. Um, I'm just sort of seeing where does things like increasing water capacity or water, potable water resilience come in? I see built environment. I see the policy pathways. Um, natural environment, if it's not water in the key moves, yep. or whatever we're calling them now, priority actions, where would it sit? Through the chair. Uh, so that is a, a clear um, focus within the actions, um, to reassure you of that. There isn't a water priority, as has been noted. Within the built environment priority, there is a clear action um, focused on water supply and understanding water supply, both from the, um, the context of population growth and also projected climate change impacts. So that is something we've been working closely with Watercare on. Um, Sorry, just mindful of that because that's at, at the moment we've got 50,000 homes who aren't Watercare customers and that's where I'm looking at another, that other focus as well. So 
water care won't be doing that. It's about what we can do as a council in terms of policy and regulation. I hope that's picked up. That's not, yeah. not everybody's a water care customer. Yeah. There's about 10% of our population that isn't, or housing. Through the chair. <laughs> um, there, there is a sub theme that also goes right the way through the adaptation side, which is about the natural hazards. And that's where we will pick up a lot of those resilience pieces. We'll pick up the resilience in the climate and community, oh, sorry, in the community piece, but we'll also be driving it right the way through because natural hazards is how we're going to see the effects of... Um, climate change as it comes through. So it is a, a, an underlying theme for everything we're doing. Thank you. I, yeah, that's what I wanted to just know where it's at, because it is about resilience and adaptation and a whole lot of other issues. So that's good. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cooper. Councillor Darby. Uh, thanks, Chair. And just before my question, there was a political question there. Brief political responses. It's going to be up to us to back up. And um, for two years, Auckland Transport has been telling us that it has got a very lean operational budget. It's down to zilch. So we're going to have to make some decisions and we're going to have to give them the direction as to what stops or slows down and what accelerates. It's as simple as that. So uh, future decisions for us to make and take responsibility for. My question, in the early discussion, there was um, some some mention of, of uh, an advisory, a climate advisory panel. And recently I've discussed with the chair and the deputy about the possibility of establishing something that I was terming, uh, discussed with the mayor about an Auckland Futures Forum. And it's probably, I'm thinking of it on the back of the success of the Merrill Housing Task Force, which sort of started out as the Housing Summit, as I termed it, and it became a, a very successful entity with 33 really clear recommendations that were built out of not just the council, but they were built out of the reach into the private sector, NGOs, etc. cetera. Is, is, there, is there the potential to actually, as we progress this work, which is not just Auckland Council work and will not go anywhere if it's just an, an Auckland Council organisational response, is there merit in, in establishing an entity which is a, quite a bit more than your climate advisory panel that actually maybe uses the model of the Merrill Housing Task Force, I'm loosely calling it the Auckland Futures Forum, with climate change as its core to, to, to try and get some advice from, from the, the private sector or the all Auckland sector into us to guide our response and our future decision making? Um, Kia ora, Councillor. Um, I guess short answer is yes, of course. Um, the independent advisory group was set up um, largely to uh, um, check and challenge the work that we were doing in preparation for this climate plan, make sure the science was robust. Um, so it is largely academic. Um, we are now talking to them about the role that they play going through implementation of the specific plan. But the um, short answer is, of course, you know, if we see value in that group plus others, because obviously there's a broader view that you're looking for, then, um, yeah, we can have that discussion, no doubt. Where do we, where do we have that discussion? Sorry, I don't want to leave it there. Um, where? <laughs> yeah, where, do we, where and when do we have that discussion? Um, um, Councillor Hills and Councillor Coomer are meeting with the chair and deputy of that independent advisory group next week. I think we've teed something up, so we can start the conversation there at least. About the potential to, to grow it out from that? Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Darby. Councillor Henderson. Thanks, Mr Chair. Um, two questions. So I'll be watching over the decades as the law gets settled around uh, climate refugees. This will be a potentially a massive challenge for us, where if we're looking at a 3.5 scenario, there will be entire nations that will go underwater and those people will need somewhere to go. So in relation to this plan, and particularly the built environment transport planning space, does this plan sufficiently cover planning challenges that could come from a potentially large influx of climate refugees in a short amount of time? Um, uh, short answer is yes, that sits as one of the actions. And apologies again, we're getting into some of the detail that we haven't had time to bring to you. Um, um, but there is a specific work around modelling what does that look like? You know, what are we looking at and how do we respond to that? Obviously, feeding into 
our growth and infrastructure strategy team, our spatial, you know, how, how and where do we grow? So short answer is yes, the plan has got work in there. Um, but again, we'll, we'll bring that to uh, a Thank you. Uh, second question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, how does this apply to events? And I'm, I'm not naming any particular events where uh, people are given plastic bottles. <laughs> <laughs> Hundreds, of Hundreds of them. Thousands of them. Yeah. Will, will this now be frowned upon as per our plan? <laughs> I, <laughs> I guess there's um, there's a few things. Um, one is in terms of work that we're doing with our council controlled organisations and where we have direct control and. Um, We've been, um, we have a group of sustainability managers across council and our impact or the work that we do as an organisation is critical to that. So where we run those events and how we run them in a way that is zero waste and low emissions is key. Um, the second bit is about how we influence others, which kind of I think talks to Councillor Bartley's point about who else is on the board or who else needs to be here to drive that, appreciating that some of those events aren't necessarily council events, but we need to do that. Yes, and uh, Councillor Simpson and I are asking many questions about that currently and we're waiting on another answer, but that may be also a question for the Ports of Auckland who were, uh, when we meet with them on the CCO dis discussion, as it was, um, they were the lead on that event, and yes. Councillor Simpson. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Look, I just want to start by saying congratulations. Um, this is fantastic work. And I think, um, before I ask my two short questions, just to note the 3,000 respondents, you know, you said, say, X number of, but to just put it into context, remember we only had 500 on the city centre master plan refresh, and uh, to date we've only had about 1,800 on our annual budget, so it is actually quite significant. Um, and I'm very pleased to note that, of course, Iraqi is one of the top five respondents, so that's very good. But my question is, why did we get nothing from Great Barrier? None of those five questions had any response from Great Barrier. Why was that? Do you know? I mean, they're really good on this sort of stuff usually, but it was zero, 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 zero all the way through. Through the chair, to be honest, can't answer that question. It was something through the public perception survey. We ensured that we did go out and get representation from all of the local boards. For, from the consultation responses, mm. we just don't know the okay. answer, to be honest. I just, just asked, unusual. Everybody else had some sort of percentage and some sort of people feedback. They got Absolutely. one person that sort of said no, and all of a sudden, you know. Mm. Okay, and my question just on the resolution to you, Mr. Chair, um, just on a um, I or one, um, introducing an overarching ta or should that be Tamaki Makoto response? Why are we just saying Tamaki response? Yeah. Tamaki is my good learned colleague, neighbour. Councillor Bartley's <laughs> area, and if we're just talking about her, fine, but we're not, are we? <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's um, yeah, no, that's good. That that's good feedback, and we can discuss Please, that. Could you just, uh, if the mover and the second are, are in agreement, I think if you're going to use Tamaki, you should use the correct term. Yep, I'm ha I'm happy with that, but we can discuss that during the um, debate if there is any concern um, around that. So, thank you. Good point. Sorry, Councillor Fletcher. Oh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I'd like to thank the officers, um, but I was really intrigued um, and challenged by the question that was put to you by Councillor Casey. And I, I want to support what she is highlighting, and that is how do we take this out of the political domain? I don't see this as necessarily needing to become political questions if we, while we're setting the framework, actually ensure that there is adequate monitoring between what we say and what we do, and that there is transparency around that, and if we were to require more formalisation of that, what what would what might that look like, Alex or Sarah? <laughs> you know, how how can we do this? This is an issue that must not be politicised. This has to be something that we all get together and do in the most apolitical way. So I feel it's beholden on us to, to try, while we're looking at the framework, to say um, these are the, the mechanisms that we will use for regular evaluation, we will monitor this, we will report this. Um, did you consider that in terms of the report today? If not, are there things that we should add at this point? 
Um, kia ora, Councillor. Um, and, and I guess, and, and uh, I don't actually, I, I saw the political part of Councillor Casey's question, but actually, organisationally, um, so those of you know, I, I kind of come to this seat fairly recently, but the scale of change within the organisation about how we're thinking about climate has shifted quite remarkably from my perspective. You know, if we are real and honest, um, climate change was always something that was there that we talked about, but we didn't necessarily act on. Um, over the last six to nine months, I've seen that change within the decisions, within the exposure that the ELT have given and council, within that sustainable that group of managers that I work with across the CCOs. Um, that's not to say it's going to be easy. Um, and I think, as has been alluded to, this is this is difficult. And the scale of the change that we're talking about is is in that radical area. And that takes, uh, granted we don't have a lot of time, that takes some time to get through. Um, but there is the will, and, and there's definitely work going on about how, our, how Auckland Council responds. Part of that you'll see through the long-term plan, so where and how do we make sure that there is budget to deliver on Council's contribution to this plan? Recognising, as as well was alluded to, this is a broad plan for the region. So I guess hopefully um, I can give you comfort that there is change going on in terms of how we reflect it. I think we need to push harder, and that's kind of my role in, the, in this seat is to challenge the organisation as well, to go, hang on, you know, this is how we've done things before, but that's in a world where we haven't had to think about climate change in the way that we do now. And actually the way we do things might need to be quite different. Um, so if I can give you that comfort, I suppose, that things are moving, um, we do need, we, we always do need that political push to make sure that actually we're responding in the right way, but this is quite big change for the organisation and other organisations in the region. I accept that, but I guess uh, in an organisational sense, you know, we, we sitting around the table here um, with the Independent Morris Statutory Board and the elected members have um, a, a governance role and I think it's a failure in terms of the proposal that we're not actually factoring in the monitoring and specifying the... Um, the, the reporting to the degree that will ensure that we do go beyond rhetoric and depoliticise this so we're dealing with facts. We're not just dealing with feel good. So I'd like a more detailed response from you on how what might improve this to take into account what I, I would like to see. Apologies, I missed that bit. So the, 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 the monitoring and the target setting is a key part of the plan. Um, it will come through in April in terms of actually what are the targets that we're aiming for at a regional level, but also at an Auckland Council level. Um, and so that, that, I think, in one of the slides earlier, you know, highlighted that monitoring and target setting is actually part of the, part of the plan. So apologies if I missed that um, question. Well, I, I'll look forward to that in April in terms of seeing the specifics that you are putting to us to how this will be reported um, in the most yeah, appropriate way. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. And I do take what Councillor Fletcher and somewhat of what, uh, what Councillor Darby is saying too. Is it an independent kind of monitoring or is it how are we reporting? I think I, I'm not putting words in your mouth, Councillor Fletcher, but you know, how do we ensure that it's not politicised, that it's sitting... So those of us who were involved in setting up the state of the environment for the Hurricane Golf and those sorts of things, we, we wanted to be able to deal with facts on a regular basis. Probably mm. we don't deal with them often enough, but just to make sure we've got our equivalent of that coming back here. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Newman. Good morning. Resume my right to speak. Uh, I just wanted to, and you've talked about your need to, your starting work now in terms of um, really fleshing out what radical change and what people's understanding of what radical change will mean. But just in terms of the initial consultation, what was the understanding of the respondents at the time as to what the radical change was that they were making to their lives that they were agreeing to? Through the chair, through those consultation, it's a 20 minute survey with quite a lot of questions to get through. So actually for the questions on radical change, it was a scale. So a scale was given of one to 10 with groupings, whether it was moderate change, low change or radical change, and people were grouped in that way. 
Were the, were the respondents given any direction as to what the low, moderate and, and radical would actually be? I mean, some of this is quite binary. For example, were those who were uh, agreeing to the radical change understanding that, well, radical change will involve them giving up their car and doing mode shift where they're relying wholly or overwhelmingly on public transport from now on. Are people aware of that? Um, radical change could be, well, actually, people will shift from their outer suburban home on the section and they'll move to an apartment. Were they aware of that when they agreed to it? I think um, short answer is no. We didn't provide that kind of what does radical mean, and that is as kind of Sarah alluded to in the slides. That is a limitation to to that that um, survey. So you've talked about that you are now going to be interrogating this question in more detail and really driving into the specifics as to okay, I agree or I have agreed to radical change. Now I'm going to uh, apply that radical change to my life and this is what it will mean. So when will we know more about uh, what, that, what that actually means? Practical the practical implications, thank you, and people's willingness to actually make those, um, those changes, because I think that there is a difference between people's willingness to rate, rate themselves a six and seven on a scale and to go and give up the car and catch the bus and move to an apartment. Through the chair, we are looking at a communications campaign kicking off from around mid-year onwards leading up to LCP where we will be talking to Aucklanders a lot more about what radical change looks like, what the kind of actions are needed to actually deliver our climate goals. So there'll be a whole range of communications going out from mid-year through to the LCP consultation so that Aucklanders are more able to understand some of the questions coming through with regards to LTP as well. I reserve my right to speak to you. Thank you, Member uh, Councillor. Uh, member Karen Wilson. Uh, th thank you. I I absolutely agree. I'm going to file all those questions that have already been uh, asked uh, by way of the councillors because uh, clearly we are interested. All I'm going to concentrate on, which will be short and sharp, is around um, wording. And so I I heard uh, the word partnership being used, and implicit or evident in the documentation is the treaty. So uh, are you using those in the right ways when you're, when you're talking? Um, I would hazard a guess that some of them are relationships as opposed to partnerships that you're speaking to. That will make a huge difference. Um, and then the um, kōrero around, uh, as we were getting into more detail around the priorities, I can't recall specifically, and uh, the comment was made um, around Māori, that will remain. Don't worry about it too much. That will remain. That, that should never be any corridor that should be expressed um, by your staff in terms of the significance of Māori, given the name uh, of the framework. So it's just making sure, uh, in terms of the consultation, and I expressed that in the uh, workshop that was held at the same time, there was a difference between activations, which wasn't necessarily a survey, and yet the response rate is quite high. So again, I emphasise my concern around the difference between an activation I'm talking about Māori, I can't speak on behalf of anything, and um, consultation, so getting that wording um, absolutely correct would be fine. And then in terms of the uh, MIS, the Māori Impact Statement, um, included in there is um, other ethnicities, which isn't the intention of a Māori Impact Statement, as you're aware. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Member Orson, and uh, I think we take all that on board and we'll obviously make sure we um, improve on that. Thank you, Member Wilson. Uh, Councillor Walker, and then uh, lastly we've got... Sure, um, and of course I reserve my right to speak as well. Um, so have a, a question around leadership and advocacy. Are we going to be having a, a section in our plan around that? Um, thinking particularly, and you might go to this, uh, around our membership of groups like C40, ICLEI, our relationship with other um, cities in Australasia, Oceania, picking up on Councillor Henderson, our relationship with Pacific Island uh, nations, because we need to be providing a lead there and could well be accepting climate refugees, and I would suggest will be into the future. 
And I guess part of what goes to that also, uh, and I'd ask this by way of question, is linking with uh, programs um, across resilient cities. Uh, other cities are part of that. And what follows also around this is benchmarking with other cities across our aspirations, goals, and, um, and, and targets. Um, so short answer is yes, there, is a, there will be a leadership and governance type section and talk about the commitments that we have made, um, the groups that we are involved in, and um, what might we need to do as well. Will that also cover off groups that we might not be involved with, but should be, um, so that we're applying a lateral approach? Um, we can definitely bring that to April. Thank you, and Count, uh, Deputy Mayor, Councillor Cashmore. Thanks, thanks very much, team. This is, you know, it's not easy stuff, and it's, it's challenging for everyone in the community, I think. Councillor Newman brings up a point. The realities may bring forward some really stark choices for people, and we've just got to be, be brave about how we challenge those. One of the questions I have got, Alec, um, for the team is the start and finish points for the measurements that you're going to bring forward to some actions. Where are those actions? What is the stark measurement for the start point? And we want to get to, and I'll give you a, a, an equation, and you don't know about this, it's about agriculture. So we're the low, lowest carbon footprint of any nation in the world for agricultural production. And if we're going to knock agriculture around by making them reduce carbon footprints to an even greater extent, given the fact that they're lower than anyone else internationally, and we reduce food production, we then have to input food from nations that have exponentially higher carbon footprints. So the challenges around how are you going to measure those quotas, the start point and the end point, are going to be very, very important We you put them on a sliding scale for the actual realities. Um, I, I think you make a great point, and, and, um, and we'll kind of factor that into the, the, the target setting. The other point I think that you made through that is the complexity of the system um, that we live in. Uh, and that's something that we need to address, and we talked about systemic change, making sure that some of the actions that we take don't actually have perverse outcomes. So for example, a similar example is in terms of steel manufacturing. Um, if we don't address the way that we're using steel, then we're still going to import steel and therefore we might actually have a, a, a higher footprint. So, so those complexities are really tough to, to, to work through, but we need to make sure that we're actually delivering a, 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 an actual response to this issue. Thank you very much. Okay, so we've ended uh, questions there. So now we move to uh, the debate. I will just, uh, I'll speak at the end, but I'll just quickly give you just another rundown of the changes because they are different to the uh, agenda. So the um, on my discussions with the IMSB, very good points were brought forward around the Tamaki Makoto approach. Um, as an overarching goal. That was the intent, but I think it's important to have it sitting there um, above the other two actions, which will feed back through um, that. So that's the change. There's also a change um, ensuring that mana whenua are continued um, to provide direction of the next two months while we, the document is being written up and ensuring they're very aware and feed into the changes. The B is seek direction from mana whenua on the naming process, process of te taruki atafiri. So my personal view was that this um, was the name for 18 months. I am just, uh, and the IMSB are just wanting to ensure that we have followed the correct process around um, gifting uh, taonga, like a name like this, as part of this, and ensuring that it's still the approach if this is, will stay. Um, or if there's another Māori name that Mana Whenua would prefer, or that, or that this is fine, but we just want to have the flexibility in these resolutions to ensure that that is the correct um, way and we're not using a name that may or may not be uh, the perfect way. And if I haven't got that right, please correct me, but I feel, yeah. So they are important changes, but um, don't necessarily change the integrity of, or, or the, the discussion of the original document, but we just want, I, I feel they're important. Um, so you're welcome to debate or vote whatever on those, but I um, and the Deputy Chair feel confident that those are important parts of the plan. So um, now on to speaking turns, Councillor Newman. Okay. okay, well, um, thanks very much. Um, I think this is very good work, and I think this is 
interesting um, grist for future conversations. I'm trying to work out um, if I'm a radical or if I'm a conservative, because I think to a certain extent I'm a radical. For example, I would want to treat and reuse wastewater to ensure supply, security of supply in the future, and I think that would make a good contribution. I'm up for voting to downzone uh, future urban zone land um, because I actually think we need to stop uh, with all of the um, destructive um, gobbling up of land for um, greenfields suburban development. I'm for downzoning coastal land because I think that actually we need to, in the face of changing weather patterns, we need to get realistic about what we cannot do in relation to those coastal zones areas subject to uh, inundation. I'm for supporting future um, carbon sinks uh, within watersheds so that uh, um, now unproductive rural land we can actually do something useful with it and, and create carbon sinks. And I'm for a, a focus on public transport based on actually contracting new services to outer suburban communities not just what we currently do, which I think is a bit boutique, which is worrying about subsidies for existing PT users, the lucky few in the inner suburbs who have public transport. We talk about our concern about what bus drivers get paid, but actually the real focus in public transport needs to be about contracting services for communities that don't currently have it. That would be a real contribution to public transport. But the conservative part of me says, well, actually, I want to get Mill Road done. Uh, and I can tell you hand on heart that I, I will not be moving to an apartment. I'll be continuing to live in my outer suburban home um, and I will be driving my car. Uh, I will be making some changes that sort of put me in the moderate category, like I'm happy to improve insulation. Um, I will be addressing all future water leaks. Uh, and I'm happy to plant some trees. So um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to quite work out where I am, but in reality, what I'm really concerned about is this. Um, we all have a framework here which talks about the need to get radical, but when push comes to shove, we don't really. Our inclination is not, to, well, the budget's constrained, it's really hard to change the unitary plan, uh, it's just all just seems so hard, so we'll kind of talk about it, but the further we push down the road, the sort of channeled response gets tighter and tighter, and in the end, it really doesn't look that radical. So I want to thank you for this, because um, the reality is, uh, and it has been foreshadowed by others, that when it comes to choices in the future, some of the choices that we make um, aren't that radical, and, and we kind of like talk like we're rather woke about the needs of the poor and that, but when it comes to it, we're not actually making the changes that provide those people with more choice. I would hope that you would support me uh, so that we can help to make some of those difficult choices because those poor people who live in outer suburban Auckland who have the least choice are the ones who need to be supported the most so that they can make the change and adapt to what I think will be necessary change in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Newman. Oh, how do I? <laughs> um, <laughs> Councillor Walker. I'm entirely supportive of this uh, of this process, and I'm mindful that the the team assembled here need to equip themselves so that we've got adequate budget, budgeting and resourcing for the long-term plan. I guess what I'm particularly mindful of, and I see it on a day-by-day -day and a week-by-week -week basis, is that our decisions and our uh, response don't reflect our talk. So I'll give you a few examples. So yesterday, I think it was yesterday, we had the issue around a marina strategy. Um, fundamentally, people in the community coming to us because we're looking to flog off, that is sell, critical waterfront land that is on the front end of sea level rise that goes to adaptation. And it's the land that we need for our ferry services into the uh, future and connectivity and where people, iwi and New Zealanders generally want to access the water. So that's this week. 
and that particular issue has not been advanced since the resolution in March last year, a whole year. On Monday, I think it was, I attended a, uh, a structure plan uh, workshop for Dairy Flat and Silverdale. Huge area. Not one mention around climate change. So I brought a whole range of things to the attention of the planners around there and said, this stuff really needs to be being considered at base one. Um, not until there's some later plan and, and, and the like, which is wishful thinking. So those sorts of things are, are, are really important. On a day-by-day -day basis, we are granting consents for further development in floodplains in areas that uh, Councillor Newman and Councillor Stewart and others are aware of. So we are doing that on a day-by-day a -day basis. And just recently, we've eliminated or looking to eliminate the Auckland Design Office, which in the central city area has done great work, I would suggest, that goes directly to climate action. But that's being eliminated at a operational level. I understand some time ago a decision was made to relinquish our membership of ICLEI, an international organisation of one and a half thousand cities, which is the only organisation that exists at an advocacy level on the part of cities and towns and assists us, for example, when we go to Conference of the Parties, COPs, as I did at my expense to the Paris Climate Talks and others, and links us into any number of programs that a myriad of other cities are engaged with. Yes, we're engaged with C40, but as Auckland, we have a unique role because we will be the only city in New Zealand ever able to join C40, I would suggest, because generally it's only open for mega cities. So we we broker that relationship between the big cities and the small cities, and we as a city have a crucial lead role in New Zealand. So we should be doing everything that we can. And I could list a number of other things. So it is, it is imperative that the seismic shift that you're talking about, Alec, happens much more urgently within the organisation, because if not, we're, uh, we're losing it. And I guess the last thing I would say is... We've got a drought through the entire North Island now, and people in my communities and other communities on tank water are effectively being penalised through the policies of water care and the actions of this council. And that also goes to things around resilience. So if we look at ourselves in terms of what we're doing now and what our community sees, we need to be walking the talk. And this is great, but you're going to need a lot more resource through the long-term plan and significant leadership from the Mayor who will be leading that process to make it happen. And I look forward to that. Thank you, Councillor Walker. And maybe if I could just have the officers maybe step back from the tables so we remember debating through the chair or to each other rather than um, at the officers. Of the... Oh, no, I wasn't, it wasn't uh, at you, uh, Councillor Walker, but just thought it would be a bit clearer. No, it's fine. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, they can hear, but I just want to make sure that the presentations happen. Now we debate together, not debate with the officers. Cool. Uh, uh, Deputy Chair Coombe. Oh, tēnā koe, Mr Ke um, Chair. Kia ora koto. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of the motion. Um, I hope I can keep it to the point. Um, we all know we declared a climate emergency last year and that the consensus around climate change science is settled. Um, we must act and provide the leadership that's needed. And it really is going to be critical that we start on a pathway to decarbonise urgently over the next 10 years. Um, we've really had a clear direction from the public with support for direction on our targets, making them more assertive, um, stepping up our adaptation work and that we're actually acting as if there is an emergency with urgency and I'm glad that um, Dr Hewitson was able to come along and present and support because um, him as part of the Waitematalo Carbon Network supporting the school strike for, for climate and um, that's what they've told us very clearly and I think 
this has been a very thorough um, consultation process and we've heard overwhelmingly from young people about the need for us to take action and the need for this plan, which I can see is shaping up to be a plan for Auckland. And I do acknowledge that in supporting the direction of this plan, we are going to take more direction from mana whenua. So I think, I think the IMSB members for bringing that forward with us. And um, so that we, when we do land on this plan in July, it's just got huge support around the table. Um, and it is going to be a plan. I'm very keen that we call it um, Auckland's Climate Plan um, because it has to be a plan that is for all Aucklanders, whether they're in business, um, iwi, hapu, schools, households, NGOs, government. And we did hear a lot about the importance of partnership and actually that partnership being framed in real terms, starting with the treaty, um, and how we bring that through in the plan. Um, and so I do want to particularly commend this, the direction of this plan and particularly how it responds for the need for a just transition. And that's something that came through very strongly in the responses. And that it's an, out, an equitable outcome as well, because we know that our most vulnerable communities are going to be impacted the most by climate change and are being impacted. Um, and then if we do do these actions in this plan, we do um, <laughs> radically decarbonise, and I acknowledge um, Councillor Newman's comments about what does actually radical mean, and I don't think we, we really can get our heads around just that it is going to be a very different approach to everything we do. There is no more business as usual. It is a, a very assertive target, and it's going to mean very um, in-depth changes for everybody. Um, but there is a huge upside. Cleaner air, greener streets, less social isolation, um, more connectivity, a, re a resilient economy, something that is very um, topical right now as we face a, a crisis, and that's where the Transition Town movement came from, is that we actually have to transition um, to a low-carbon lifestyle because it will make us more resilient to whether it's oil shocks or climate change or natural disasters. It will mean that we'll have strong commu stronger communities all around. And also, um, what I also really commend in this plan too is it means that we will be putting into practice what it means to um, honour the principles of the treaty and also to acknowledge Māori knowledge systems. And that's I look forward to that being embedded into the plan because I think we're all richer and wiser for that. Um, I know that there's a lot of people when, you know, a, go a good plan has many parents and a successful outcome, and it is too early to celebrate. This is, we're not, we're only on the, on the journey. This isn't the plan, but I do just want to acknowledge, you know, where we've, we've come from and the founders um, particularly those who've been talking about climate change for a long time, and I'm glad that we acknowledge um, Jeanette Fitzsimons today, because she, she was saying that this is urgent 30 years ago and people were laughing at her and calling her a wacky greenie. Um, but those, those people who have been very prescient um, from previous, from our, our, our forebears who really did um, understand the importance of us grappling with climate change. And then more recently in our Auckland Council history, um, rolling on in the last 10 years, Councillor Walker even, oh no, I shouldn't say even, I would like to acknowledge you um, as well as the first um, chair of the Low Carbon Committee that was in first term, and you led the foundation for a lot of this work. Jeanette's um, a good friend of mine, or was. Uh, thank you, for, um, Wayne. Um, and and uh, uh Penny Hulse, who led this through into this draft and put a lot of that work, and the, the, the huge, amazing team that have been working around this, um, and Alex's predecessor, John Moreau, as well, and all your team, and I won't start n naming everybody. But, um, but most importantly, and if I could just wrap up, is just everyone who did submit, hooied, um, petitioned, raged, protested, 
advocated and really got us to this point. You know, that's all of Aucklanders who've been engaged in this process. I really do um, thank them for, for being part of this democratic process that brings us to this plan. Um, so as I've said, you know, it is, it is too early to congratulate each other, um, but thank you, Mr. Chair, for your leadership into this term. Um, and, you know, I do look forward that we will have those continuing discussions with mana whenua as we shape this into um, the plan. And I think we're on the right direction, so I really do want to commend this um, to members. Kia ora, thank you. Councillor Henderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and I want to speak in, in enthusiastic support of the plan. Um, so individual actions are great, but we need to move beyond individual action towards structural changes in how we're planning our city and how we're supporting our environment and investing in our transport. And I just want to point out as part of the plan that huge regulatory issues are implicit in all of this, not just in our zoning, but in things like energy conservation, and we have to work with the building industry and things on these points. It's going to require bravery. I, I really want to support Councillor Newman uh, in public transport to outer communities. I'm really glad you said it, um, because this is a challenge for us as councillors. If we put on these buses to outer communities and the media picks up how many people are using it, and I saw an empty bus the other day, we need to be brave and we need to respond appropriately. In Piha, we have a community there with about 1,000 people in it. We've got a major tourist attraction that is used by thousands in, in the summer, and we have no choice but to drive there. There's no choice. If 30 people or so use a bus service all day, that's still 20 cars off the road. That's still emissions reductions, and we need to start thinking about it not just in terms of money, but in how much we're actually reducing our emissions by our policies as well. We have, we have a huge issue around rural footpaths, where we have entire communities in my ward that drive short distances to drop the kids off to school, a couple of hundred metres down the road. That's crazy. And that, that is carbon emissions going up and up and up. So we need to talk about pricing things and evaluating things, not just in terms of money, but emissions. And I want to support Councillor Casey and her brilliant points as well. The issue for us will be, thank you, yeah, good smile. Um, the issue for us is that the bill is large, but the bank account isn't. That's right. so, <laughs> so that's a challenge, and we're going to have some very serious discussions over this term around that. Um, but in discussing the importance of all this, I really do need to raise the situation around our Pacifica Fano, and not just ones that are in Auckland, but across the world. Um, people are losing their homes and losing their communities. My ward has a large Tuvaluan population. Now that's 11,000 people on, the, on that island, and it's sinking into the ocean. So we need to remember that we're actually talking about people's lives here when we discuss this. That's how serious we're talking. So I really commend the plan. I think it's great work. Thank you for all your work. And I hope that we can put that into concrete actions. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Uh, Mayor Goff, if you could just switch. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And can I just begin by thanking Alex and Alec and Sarah, the Sarahs, and Matthew and the team for the huge amount of work that's gone into that. I think we all recognise um, you're putting your heart and soul into it. <clears throat> Second thing is um, we're still at a very high level. So we haven't got down to the really difficult decisions. Um, <clears throat> but if we don't set the strategy and we don't set the vision at the level we need to, then we're not doing our job. So that's what you've, you've done to date. <clears throat> Thirdly, will this process be easy or painless? And the answer is a resounding no. Because the, sec the, the question after that <clears throat> is, does it require major change? You can use the word radical if you like. And the answer is absolutely. Because if we're setting out to reduce emissions by 50% by 2030, that is huge. That is, that is life changing and lifestyle changing and none of us <clears throat> should have any thought that it is something uh, other than that. We have set the target at 1.5 degree uh, temperature rise. That's what the international obligation is that has been placed on us. That's what we have accepted. But if the answer is that you do need radical change and it will be painful, the next question is, do you have the choice? And what I say very clearly here is, no, we don't have the choice unless we want to leave a rotten legacy 
to our kids and our mokopuna. And that's why we need to make the hard decisions now. They won't be easy. And the first question that we had to begin with is what you began the presentation with, was an analysis of the submissions, about 3,000 of them, and a survey of 2,000. Survey really important because it gives us a cross-section. So what did that tell us? Uh, it told us in the submissions that over 90% thought that our consultation document took us in the right direction, and it told us that 79% thought that Auckland Council need to play a key role in this. So that, uh, in, in one sense at least, gives us a mandate. The Colmar Brunton survey was really interesting because it showed that three out of four people believe that climate change uh, is uh, human-driven. Um, Trump represents, obviously, the other 25%. Um, Three out of four believe that <coughs> human action, <coughs> sorry, is that we, they have a medium or high concern ab about climate change, and they believe that we need to uh, make medium or radical change. Now, do they understand what the radical change is? Not yet. We need to explain that. Uh, and that's why, <coughs> when I look at the framework, it starts with why. We need to constantly reinforce why we need to make these major changes. You have to look at the drought and you have to look at the sea level rise and you understand what that is, but we need to keep pushing that. You need to set out the what is the next question, and this paper and the presentations we've had set that out. 44%, for example, of our emissions from transport, so we need to change that. We need to have uh, electrification, we need to have mode shift, we need to have uh, a more compact city. And those are the things that we have to push for. Those are critical, and where's the city have a say in that? Um, we also need to look at how we generate, use, and conserve energy. We need to look at how we can reduce waste. They are the what's. The critical question now that we face is the how. So we know, and it's set out in the paper that we've received, we need to reduce, um, we need 33% of the vehicle fleet to, to have zero emissions. We're not even at 1% yet. So is this going to be hard? You, you, you bet it. It is going to be hard. We need to have the, the bus fleet 100% electric. We control that. Um, but that's going to be not easy, but we should do it. Uh, we need to have 40% of our dwellings in transit-oriented developments. We're heading in the right direction, but we've got a way to go. So the how is the next big step and the important step. And the steps after that, or the steps at the same time as that, actually, are uh, what's it going to cost? and how are we going to pay for it? So, you know, we can give the big speeches around this table, but the crunch point comes when we look at what it's going to cost and how we're going to pay for it. Uh, and the final point, Mr Chair, I want to end on is, do, are we doing this on our own? No. Uh, we have to have critical partnerships. One, we have to show the leadership. We have to tackle the emissions that we create as council, and that's why the annual plan uh, starts off by knocking those emissions by 20%. But we also need to look at the levers, how we influence our communities, individuals, and our businesses. And, you know, we, we had a session yesterday, we talked to the business, what are you doing about climate change? Well, the, the truth is, at the moment, not a hell of a lot. <clears throat> and they have to be part of the solution, and that has to be by persuasion, or we have to use the levers, whatever levers we might have. But the biggest partnership of all is with central government, because we know that as long as we, we're, you know, bringing in 65 diesel SUVs for every one electric car, we're not going to come anywhere near achieving the target. So we have to advocate to and support initiatives from the central government. All of this is really bloody hard, but we have to do it. It's probably the biggest challenge that we will face as a council in this term and in our next and in our future terms. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, oh, thank you, Mayor Goff. Councillor Casey. I won't take too long, but I just want to record history that I actually agree with Councillor Fletcher and Councillor Newman and the words he said about the actions that are needed by this council. And they use words like radical, revolutionary, brave and urgent. And I want to hark back to, I don't know if Grant's still here. Grant came before us this morning and said that we need to recognise the emergency. And that is critical. And I think we actually should insert the word emergency into the title of this document. And even when we put in our climate impact statement, it should be climate, climate emergency impact statement. 
So I wonder if the, if the chair would consider that while I'm talking, insert the word emergency into the title. So it's Auckland's Climate Emergency Action Framework. Because that's the bit we're not linking up with. Daniel was absolutely right. We are a slow lumbering beast that travels at glacial speed. We don't do urgent, we don't do brave, we don't do revolutionary, we don't do radical. And I think we need to, if we're going to put this, this um, worthy document um, into action. And so it's a plea for that. And again, I'll hark back to the two examples I gave earlier. Buchanan Street in Glasgow was pedestrianised 48 years ago. And here we had, oh, sorry, you can correct me if I get out of line, but here we have Auckland Transport saying it will take them a year to trial something. Ask the Waitamata local board to do it. They'll do it in a couple of months, easily. So I don't get that. And sorry, Chris, you said it's up to us. Well, it is up to us, but we didn't do it. We just accepted that. Just like we're accepting there could be another bus strike, which is my second point. We're only as good as our buses being on the road. I support the mayor. Absolutely, we need a 100% electric fleet. But we actually need buses on the roads running, whether they're diesel or electric. And if there's a chance that that's not going to happen because Auckland Transport haven't put any money up front, then we should be telling Auckland Transport to shift their money around within their budget to make sure that the drivers we said last December we support fully, that they should have decent working conditions because they're our backbone. And we're just sitting here saying, hmm, oh yeah, OK. Do anybody know that there's going to be a strike? Anybody doing anything about it? Well, let's, let's, let's take the action that this kind of... Um, policy demands of us. Do it, ask the questions. If you go down Wesley, is it well Wellesley Street West right now? They've closed the road. People are loving it. They're all saying, when's Queen Street going to be? You love it because you can cross the road over to the town hall without having to wait for half an hour. So oh, it's just that. So thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Christine. It's about, it's about Taking the actions, not just not just kind of put on wrong with the words. Please introduce the word emergency. That much just might remind us all that we do have to do it. Sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to do all that. And I'm I'm not apologising, Doctor Transport. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Casey. I we I'm not sure what to do about the adding emergency in. It sort of has come through debate and I don't want to bring the officers back in, but I'm happy to... Um, I think they're good look. Yeah. yeah. Radical. Radical. I mean... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if, the, if the mood of the room, I mean, but... It, it, I think it's a good idea. Yeah, my, my, my only um, caution is what the... Because I'm all fine with the name, but if once again, if nothing is changing, then it's just a name. So I want to know, maybe through the workshop, if that is possible and what that means in, in a... Yeah. So, unless we have a show of hands that everyone wants emergency, then we'll just stick it in. Yeah. So. yeah. I didn't understand what you said. Well, my... Yeah, stick in <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, no, because I'm hearing be bold, but my... Through the chair. I, how, how about we come back to you in the workshop in April? <laughs> because you're, you're making a decision in May anyway on it. So that, so you're not going to make a decision now. You know, we'll, we'll come back to you around the name because we need to also speak with Mana Whenua as per the recommendations as well. So I, I would find that helpful to be able to provide you some advice um, if that's... Yeah, that's and as a second, I'd like to just back that up because I think we are going to sign off the whole plan in May and that's when we can then sign off the name, the actions, the whole document. So this is setting the direction. So I don't think we should get, I mean, all respect to Councillor Casey's, she's got a good point, but we can, there is time for us to work through that. That's right. Yeah, and sorry, I didn't mean to get involved, but it was a question of me. Um, yeah, so we will discuss that at the workshop that, that Naming was not brought up for the three workshops we had, so at all, yeah, yeah. So it's um, I'm I'm all up for it, but I want to know what that exactly means, and it's not just words. So there's plenty of time to get it in the final plan. Uh, we sign off in May, but I want to um, discuss that with 
um, Hana Whenua, IMSB, other uh, local boards, things like that. So uh, before we just go and throw a word in. So apologies for getting into the debate. Member Wilson. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to sit here in suppressed excitement, believe it or not, because I, I think um, Auckland Council is underestimating uh, the work that they have completed. If I draw a parallel, and it's not really a parallel, but in my mind's eye, um, in terms of 2010, when IMSB came into creation by way of legislation, uh, as opposed to Māori seats, um, there wasn't the same excitement, there wasn't the same support um, that was necessarily, but here we sit today, uh, here we sit in being able to um, guide this, hopefully, in support of this recommendation. Um, and in my first term here, I would not have been confident that would be. Now, that does take time and nothing, uh, everything takes time. Everything is about lessons learnt. So I'm here in excitement to say you have done well, Council. It can be done a lot quicker, but don't ever believe that always we sit here. That's how I feel sometimes. Things do get done. They just get done mostly by those behind the scenes, which sit right in front of us today. And if we have faith and confidence in their ability to be well directed by us uh, as one, then no doubt, um, as we have found in this role as IMSB, we will get there a lot quicker. It's when so many pile on top of, um, we've found in our time, on those that are in, uh, required to do the work, then what priority is which. So um, please, um, we'll all give each other a pat on the back. It can be done. It can be done in a bold way. It doesn't necessarily need to be said, my view of the world. Uh, we've committed to it. You've heard the court at all. Um, we've added our piece that we acknowledge as a lesson learned. Um, that's all I'd like to say. Thank you. Kia ora, Member Wilson. Uh, Councillor Darby. Uh, thank you, Chair. And, um, yeah, there is a degree of excitement, and uh, Member Wilson's quite right. And, uh, Chair, I'd like to acknowledge you, uh, Councillor Coombe, for grabbing this by the scruff of the neck and bringing it out of the closet, because the door was sort of half closed on this work. Been out for a little while longer than that. <laughs> the work, the work. Um, and acknowledge the team, um, um, Alec um, and Sarah, Matthew, and all those that sit behind. Um, but I also acknowledge the, the Aucklanders that have responded to this. Uh, they've actually framed and polished this uh, up to being a, a better plan as the, as the teams have responded to those submissions. And it's um, been some good, good solid feedback. Um, I'm delighted that we've actually dropped the word framework uh, and we are actually in some ways back to where we were, uh, but with a lot more muscle on the bones of, of the skeleton. Um, and um, so now the real challenge in my eyes, and I think this has been addressed today, and, and, and is, that, is our consequential decisions. What, what we do from here on in is going to be absolutely critical. Um, and those consequential decisions are going to have to be strong, not puny. And they can't be back a ways, and that we can't make decisions and then pack out that decision with uh, a whole lot of greenwashing. And transport and land use are going to be some areas that we're going to have to make some quite different moves in, very, very different. Um, and I, I link the two because they're inextricably related. And uh, that falls uh, a lot in the remit of the planning committee and uh, Councillor Bartley and myself uh, are, are determined to, to lead that work. Uh, our transport emissions are considerable and that's documented in all the, all the work that's been uh, presented here today. Coming up, we've got an opportunity, it's not an opportunity, we must do it, we're going to refresh the Auckland Transport Alignment Project and we'll be doing that through a climate lens and a mode shift lens. They're the prim primary uh, two new drivers of the terms of reference and we'll get to consider those terms of reference uh, and, uh, and land that final document um, and then that will be followed by the Regional Land Transport Plan and our budget, our 10-year budget. So that's where we get to make those big decisions. Um, and we have got to front those plans with climate action and real climate action uh, no, it can't be just a faint narrative. It's got to be that bold desire that I think uh, one of my colleagues has mentioned. Now, I just want to caution going forward because 
This has already happened. The New Zealand Transport Upgrade Program Transport, Transport, the one, the $12 billion announcement of government, in the south of the city included a $1.3 billion. Now, we're talking about how do you pay for it? Here's an example. That was a $1.3 billion expenditure. What we had in ATAP and the RLTP for that corridor, the Mill Road corridor, was a plan for a, about a $550 million expenditure to do phase one. We didn't have phase two in the plan. There was no political sign-up. It's not in our strategic document. It's in an outer decade, and we advocated through council and Auckland Transport for this big $1.3 billion. Now, in my view, that is a climate exacerbator and that is where you don't spend your money. That is a climate exacerbator. This is a road that goes through pr pretty much a wetland to the east of Papakura and Manorewa and comes out in the very wet Drury. And while you might think, or we might think, that that provides housing, and it might, but my guess is it's, it's in the wrong place. And it's, is it really our priority? And so I'm, I'm just testing us here with the decisions that we make. They have to be climate future decisions uh, and they have to be to plan. We can't operate outside of plan. And th those decisions of both the government having just signed up to the Zero Carbon Act and ourselves declaring a climate emergency are contrary to plan and contrary to our own decisions. How we got there on that one and to be supportive of it is beyond me. So you think about what the balance of 550 million to 1.3 could buy you in terms of the transport that Aucklanders really need. It's that transport that reaches into all the suburban places that Councillor Newman uh, refers to. It's considerable. So the urgency that we bring uh, has to be genuine. I probably just want to uh, finish with some words that um, Fran O'Sullivan, who interviewed Sir Rob Fennick, uh, um, drew out of Sir Rob, and these are probably some of his final words. Time is running out for me, and it is with profound sadness that I consider that time is running out too for our precious environment. Sir Rob Fennick. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Darby, Deputy Mayor, Councillor Cashman. Thanks, Richard, and I can recognise you and Pippa and our staff for this work here. It's important. And we're seeing the potential enormity of what climate change could do to our economy. And I recognise what Karen said about we look at it with open eyes, we look at it with calm minds, and we come up with a plan. And you're better off taking a little bit of time to have a workable, practical, deliverable plan than one based on fear and emotion. I would like to challenge what Councillor Darby has just said, because that comes down exactly to the fear and emotion versus the pragmatism. The announcement of the infrastructure package was signalled a term ago in Parliament. The announcement um, was delayed, and this, what's happening in the South, is my ward and Councillor Newman's ward and Councillor Dalton's. What's happening down here is a new town is being created. The growth of the existing towns are all doubling. Employment is being created on a scale unprecedented in this city. 17,000 jobs for Drury in the next five or six years. And my estimations with the businesses that I know that are doubling or quadrupling their size is another 20 to 30,000 on top of that over the next 20 years. So this is about economies with live, work, play. The misdemeanor that everyone comes into the central city to work is just that. There are more people live and work in the south than in the central isthmus. So that's a reality. And if we're going to base our climate change on realities, let's get the data right. And let's get the facts right. And let's plan for a series of options, because there is not one single answer that's going to change this. There will never be one single answer. We're going to have to feed our population, which is why I gave the question to Alec before about that. 
um, you want to import quality food from Indonesia, be my guest. If we're going to retain a vibrant economy, an economy that's also around building a new city, new infrastructure, rail infrastructure, light rail, that needs steel, that needs aggregate. And one of the main reasons for the Mill Road Alternative Highway is that 88% of the aggregate for the city comes from the Franklin Ward. That's a critical factor. So you don't build a city out of theory, and you don't build a city purely out of academia. You build a city with practical, sensible planning, with the realisation that people don't all stay in the same place or work in the same place. There has to be options and opportunities. I'm all for more brownfields. You know, that's, that's a cost-effective way of delivering accommodation and housing. But you still need the opportunity for greenfields and for employment creation of new industries, new technologies, and the increasing capacity of those existing in those areas. So I implore you, Mr Chairman, to have a rational, sound discussion that is based on delivery, not on emotion. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Bartley. Thank you, Mr Chair, and I acknowledge uh, the leadership from yourself and Deputy Chair um, Councillor Pippa Coombe uh, regarding pushing this through and all the workshops that we've had to go through and acknowledging everything that you've done, Alex, Sarah, Matthew and your team. Um, I also want to acknowledge your consultation uh, by going to where the people are rather than the usual way that um, consultation has been done. Uh, these days, or around this table, I mean, in this organisation. Uh, it's really good to see the strong response from Māori and Pasifika uh, young people, um, groups that have been identified as typically disengaged from council engagement. So I think that is pretty awesome. But it's no surprise because globally, Indigenous communities are at the forefront of climate resilience. Which is what I'd like to see more of with this plan, though, is uh, the acknowledgement of Indigenous practices to address climate change. So mana whenua leading the way, uh, as opposed to just being uh, partners. Uh, picking up some comments, or a comment that was made around us leading for the Pacific Islands, they are already leading the way in climate change. In fact, they're doing it faster than we are. So, you know, let's just not think that we know best in some things. I agree with the concerns about socialising the, the change that we're going to need to make as individuals and as a community uh, in order to achieve the things in this plan. But I really do take my head off to the young people that are coming through uh, demanding that we do something. Even in the rangatahi feedback we received in the workshop, it was just do it, just get on and do it and figure it out after. I kind of like that, even though it is a little bit emotive. Um, but um, when, when you know, I, I was interviewing over the holidays uh, some young people for our Tamaki Youth Council, and the first thing that, they was on, that was on the top of their mind was climate change. They were all getting active about climate change. Uh, I was at a Manawahine event in the weekend about International Women's Day, and the guest speaker there was uh, Ainga Ngali Fili Fepulia Itapuai of 4TK, For the Culture. And it was all about climate change. You know, all these young people. So I really do admire what's coming from, from the, the, the youth of, of today. And just acknowledging that Ainga has actually been uh, selected to represent New Zealand at the Global Young Leaders Conference in America. So, um, yeah, I just, I just really, I'm not, I don't really want to say excited because I don't really say those things, but it is exciting to see what's coming from the young people. Uh, and I, I know that there's another strike coming up from, the, from, from them about climate change, but it's just, yeah, it's just awesome to see that this, this means a lot to them, it means a lot to us, and that we are doing something to kind of address these issues in a good planned way as well. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cooper. Kia ora. Um, I guess for me, I, I do want to echo some of what Councillor Cashmore said, but come from a different a angle. I did raise the question of how radical in one of our workshops. Um, I think I was probably the only one that did. But, and so for that reason, I do, I think that everybody needs to know what that means. 
because our young people are enthusiastic, but a lot of it is driven by fear. Um, you can get on, say, get on and do it, but people really need to know what they might have to give up, what they might have to take up. That is really critical for people to understand. And if also, if we want, if we write radical in the title, for me, it's important to get those other 25% of people on board with this. That's really important so that everybody is part of this and everybody can take this year. I mean, I, I mean, my husband is um, definitely a boomer and he's just bought his plug-in electric vehicle, um, hybrid vehicle, and loving it. He said he'll never go back to an internal combustion engine. However, as we say, we've got to still build those cars and we've got to have roads for those cars. So there's that sort of issue. We want electric vehicles, but they don't run on railway tracks. So we've got to find a balance and we've got to be able to create a plan that everybody can get on board with. But also, I know and we've heard that a lot of the doom and gloom is affecting our young people's mental health and that really scares me. You know, we need to be leading this as well alongside them so they can feel there's hope and that we are doing something that they don't have to keep yelling and yelling and feel a bit powerless and really scared. That is not a good thing to ramp that up too much because they are worried and we have enough youth suicide. So for me, it is about taking it sensibly. Yes, we've got to push the boundaries. We've got to change people's attitudes. We've also got to change people's behaviour and we're going to have to help people through some really tough decisions for them and their families. Um, so I do want to know what radical means, and that doesn't mean that I'm signalling that we should ramp anything down, but we need to be really clear and honest with people what that means, rather than just an adjective that rah rahs people up, because that doesn't do anything. Um, so for me, I, I, um, I'm looking forward to the definitions of what that means and actually going out to people again and going, well, are you willing? and to also change some of the 25 percenters who don't understand and don't believe, but maybe they're just scared of that word radical, and if it was defined for them, that it was doable for them and their families, they may be coming on board. So I really want to acknowledge all the staff, Megan, your staff, everybody that's been involved, and um, I'm looking forward to the next step. Kia ora. Thank you, Councillor Cooper. Councillor Watson. Chair, yeah, um, I think it's kind of warmed up a bit in here since the debate started. Um, I, I just wanted to very, very quickly um, say that in respect of uh, all the consideration of, you know, planning regimes and, you know, maybe uh, language choice and policy documentation, all the rest of it, that, that we don't lose sight that there's people have got a big head start on us around the world. and. Uh, that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, Councillor Casey alluded to that. And, and sometimes for, for countries that, you know, their, their world leading isn't always in uh, positive areas, often poorly in health. But if you take a country like Scotland, for, in, for instance, you know, they had a, a, a Climate Change Act in 2009. That's, that's 11 years ago. Um, they set greenhouse gas reduction targets of 80% by the year 2050, with an interim target of 42% reduction by 2020. That's this year, 2020. They're looking for 42% um, reduction. Um, and Council have obligations under that Act to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, put in place measures to adapt to changing climate, work in a sustainable way. So they've been doing that for 11 years. But more than that act is what cities like us are actually doing, what they're doing and have been doing for a number of years. Glasgow and Edinburgh are going head to head to see who, can, who will become the UK's first net zero city. So they're, they're almost got a competition to see who can do most uh, quickest. Um, Glasgow's got a target uh, um, well before 2045, Edinburgh, upping them, wants to have it by 2030. That's within a decade. So some of these cities around the world, and there's other ones not just in Scotland, um, they are really walking the talk. And obviously, they've been through the kind of processes that we've been through. Um, and you know, notwithstanding the fact that they're different countries with different geographical uh, determinants or the rest of it, there's obviously a lot we can, we can learn 
from them and, and can get on and do without having to kind of go through the kind of, you know, tortuous introspection that sometimes uh, kind of characterises that, you know, you know, our approach and, you know, and our admittedly rather cumbersome political setup. Let's be honest about things. Um, similarly, with, with, with places like um, Aberdeen, if you look at their council um, reporting regimes, um, big chunks of that are to do with climate change, leading and acting as an example to others through its services, planning, Councillor Newman, so they bring it into their planning, they do it in their planning and decision making, um, and reducing emissions from its own estate and services within its influence, including building transport, et cetera, et cetera, that we're talking about. So I guess, Mr Chair, what I'm saying is that we can use the examples of these other cities that are getting out there and doing it. Everyone's talked about action. Some of them are well on their way to attaining these targets, have been doing it for a while. So we actually need to speed up, not take, you know, take the kind of the time that uh, some people are urging. We need to speed up, pick up on the things we can from these other councils in the way they've done it, and, um, and really start getting some some momentum on the ground that people will buy into. Because I think the feeling is out there in the community, most people have accepted the reality and are ready for some bold action. You know, not, not, not just in the terminology we use, but in things doing. I, I think we're at that threshold now where, where there are people who say, well, yes, we have to do it. So I think rather than making it a difficulty, I think it's an opportunity for us in particular to be leaders, to, you know, to bring people with us because they're ready to go, in fact. Some of them are way ahead of us. Thank you. Councillor Philippine. It's good that I follow um, Councillor Watson because uh, the bold actions that he just mentioned is exactly what I'm uh, uh, repeating here. Um, through you, Chair, I, I want to also... Um, I want to mention our rangatahi. Um, I remember on the 30th of April uh, last year, um, I represented as his worship the mayor and council at Rua Potaka Morai because they had a rangatahi hui which was for Māori and Pacific. Now, um, at, the, at Rua Potaka Morai, uh, there were two organisations that led our rangatahi hui. Uh, that was Pare Kore Ki Tamaki and Te Ohu Mana Rangatahi. And it was awesome to be there. That led them to then come through to here to give a presentation. One of the first that we had was the turtle they brought um, um, through that. They then came to an, uh, a workshop and presented and said, we want to be part of the development of the Climate Change Action Plan or the framework. And as Worship the Mayor at the time, when it was in our Auckland, said the Rangatahi voice was a critical component in developing the Auckland Climate Action Plan. So true. This is why I, I again, just, just to reinforce what Councillor Bartley said around our Rangatahi, they are so important. So, Chair, realistic? Yes, we have to be. Uh, from my perspective, in... The setup we have here from a, 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 a elected member's perspective, perspective, that's what we've got, so we have to deal within that. Um, you know, but I, I did, however, and, and, and people talk about Papa. that's why I, I, I support B in regards to uh, mana whenua and the naming process uh, around this framework. I, I support that, but Papa is also important. And I mean, I take uh, Humbridge when I hear that, um, look, um, um, the door was half shut in regards to this, uh, the, the framework. No, it wasn't. It's never been half shut. Half shut. It's always been open. Um, and to acknowledge yourself and to acknowledge Pippa, you've now just walked through the door. I want to acknowledge um, Councillor Hulse. I, I want to acknowledge her. Um, because she took what we started in 2018 and, and what we ended up um, declaring, she took that to where we are now, and now it's left in both you and Councillor Coombs' hands. 
so I acknowledge that. Um, but I, I, I do, however, want to acknowledge Councillor Hulse, uh, ex-Councillor Hulse, because that work has now led us to this. So, you know, to say that it was half shut, guess what we did the, as through the PowerPoint that was presented? The uh, consultation finished in September, and we only had a minor thing called the election in October. And as a result, we're now in the, in, in the new governance structure that His Worship the Mayor put in place. So I do acknowledge both yourself and Councillor Coombe. But um, look, I just needed to, to say that. I wasn't going to say anything until I heard what I heard. But to our staff, um, you are going to be the people that will be bringing um, all the information. You will be bringing options to us that we, as elected members, independent Māori statutory board, will then have to make the hard decisions. So I look forward to this. I look forward to mana whenua uh, being involved, and especially our rangatahi. Kia ora. Uh, last speaker before I uh, round it all up, uh, Councillor Stewart. Thank you. A lot of it's been said, but I was just taking on board what uh, Councillor Darby was talking about um, with planning. I'm pleased that you're going to be considering planning and hopefully the unitary plan of some parts of climate change is going to be causing problems. As, as you're aware, um, I've been a broken record since 2002 about flooding and stormwater and extreme weather events in, in my patch. So that's one of the reasons that I think that I can sort of buy into this climate change plan because um, of the serious issues that are happening our, our way. Just listening to what Councillor um, Cooper was talking about, about young people with mental health, or we, uh, health issues over, over climate change. We also have a lot of, um, well, we, everybody, everybody's suffering out there. And, and uh, as I said, once again, um, out of my community, and hopefully there's going to be some parts of the unitary plan that might get looked at because of the climate change. We have people out there that um, are currently living in homes that are not, not insured and, and really unlivable. So, you know, I'd love to take you out there to have a look at some of these properties and you'll get a first-hand view. So, uh, so really, that's all I have to say, but I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm all on board with what you have to say, um, Councillor Darby, on, on perhaps we might have to change some of the unitary plan. Maybe... We haven't got everything right, so thank you for coming on board with that. I appreciate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stewart. Whew, okay, that was a fantastic debate. Um, thank you for all the speakers. It was um, shows that it's a clear, important issue for all of us. Um, I just want to quickly on the name and the name. I would prefer emergency, but with the discussions I've had with. Um, IMSB the last two days and their concerns about and it was my push from a framework to a plan, there was no discussion or cons consultation with mana whenua on that and the naming of te taruki a tawhiri to be matching with that I'm not going to turn my back on that discussion and add another word in without any discussion with mana whenua, with IMSB because I've already said I would do that so I'm not going to just throw it in to make us feel good I believe we can get there hopefully by the May um, uh, committee or the workshop in April, but I would be turning my back on those discussions I've had in, over the last two days. And I just, it's not a, this is not the way I want to chair uh, committees, it's just saying one thing to Mana Whenua and our IMSB members and then doing something different to make uh, me feel good. So just put that out there. And I do want to acknowledge uh, Mana Whenua first on this plan, our IMSB members, our um, rangtahi, the um, Kaitiaki Forum, every person um, from our Matawaka community, and the fact we had 25% turnout um, from Māori in Auckland to this plan is phenomenal, and it's probably one of the highest we've had on any um, consultation that we've done. But I think that is obvious with the example and the plan that we have in place, um, because this is what Māori have been telling us from forever, um, that we have been... Uh, degradating uh, papatuanuku, we have been using resources um, and exhausting them, and we have been poisoning our environment. So, you know, it's clear that we need to be working in partnership on this plan because they're our key partners on how that we can 
ensure that this plan is true um, to restoring our environment and restoring the Modi of um, the water and the land. And um, yeah, so just putting that out there. The second pe uh, group of people I want to acknowledge is older people. We do talk about Aurangatahi, we do talk about younger people, we do talk about you know, I marched with 70,000, mostly young people, uh, just before the election down Queen Street. But the older people, the many older people like Sir Rob, like Jeanette Fitzsimons, who have been saying this for a long time, our Komatua, they're the people who've been leading this discussion, sometimes as the only lone voice, sometimes as the, the people out there talking about pest strategy, water, about where we should be building things. They are our older people who are still here today and those who have passed on who where this wasn't a discussion that was popular there wasn't a discussion in the the mainstream media um and i thank them for that i obviously now want to acknowledge our younger people our rangatahi who this plan will most affect if we don't get this right um you know i was at, presenting at a school on saturday on climate change i was asked to come speak and one young person said what if 2050 is too late what if we are already too late what do we do then and to councillor cooper's point i felt like i didn't have enough information or or mana behind me to really explain th that answer so I, I said i didn't know and i said we would try our best but there is some fear in younger people's eyes of what the future looks like so you know want to acknowledge younger people for bringing this to the forefront more as collective i think we've had to we've seen we called a climate emergency and we um, called for the 1.5 um, target, and that was largely, I believe, to those younger people really pushing us, the Generation Zeros, the School Strike for Climate and others, which really pushed it out there so we couldn't keep saying yes but not acting. I do have down here before um, Alf spoke around acknowledging Penny and Alf, their work on this a long time before that we had called a climate emergency. The, the plan itself started in, I think, the end of 2017, and then with the team, the Sustainability Office, have done a lot of work. So it's I'm kind of jumping in, A, at a exciting time. I feel a lot of work has been done and I don't have to push um, so hard, but also I'm extremely anxious to get this right and, and with the people around this table and the, the amazing staff we have in council and other people feeding in that we will get this right, but it's not just up to me, but I feel uh, a sort of a heavy burden, but also extreme hope that we can do things and give those opportunities and choices that Councillor Newman and others are speaking about to show people the way and that it doesn't have to be scary. Because my concern is that if we don't show people the way now, the scary thing is, is if we do nothing and then we jump, have to all fall off the cliff together because we didn't make action and the choices, we don't, we no longer have choices. The things just start happening. Australia over the the um, summer holidays just keeps happening. What we're seeing now with the drought in Auckland just keeps happening. So there is a cost and there is opportunity, but this is, from my perspective, getting this playing right for the council, but also for the city, will give us the direction that will actually show us for these things to, we prevent these things from happening, to give us choices. And it's not gonna be easy, it's definitely not um, gonna be easy at all, but I think if we work on this together, and, and a lot of people say, where is business? You know, we need to bring them with us. A business, there's 118 people in the Climate Leaders Coalition, and you can go into every business of the, the huge number of things they're doing in this way that we probably need to be emulating. I, I spoke at X Labs a few weeks ago, um, opened that, and that was 20 businesses from HEB to fl uh, Fletcher's to a whole lot of other organisations, the warehouse group, all working to figure out how they can reduce their waste, how they can act on climate. Everyone wants examples. We can be a leader, but we are definitely shouldn't kid ourselves that we are leading and the only people in this conversation. I'll probably leave it there because I could go on a while, but I just thank everyone for the really positive conversations we've had. I feel as a politician, um, we all say a lot of things but don't do, but I feel that this whole table and all the staff are really doing the do and working with our other chairs and committees is going to be crucial for this. So I thank you. This is the direction, this is the structure. The next two months are crucial to make sure that plan in May is fantastic, meaningful, and it has the actions that actually play a part into reducing emissions and getting to zero emissions by 2050 and halving our emissions by 2030. So exciting. Thank you, and I'll leave it at that. Thanks. We have a division on the vote, please, Chair, if you're proceeding to the vote now. So I have moved, and Councillor Cooper has second. And we're going to go for a division on the... Um, we'll take them all together. Thank you.
division for item eight. Councillor Hills. Aye, of course. Councillor Bartley. Oh, I'm for. Councillor Casey. Yes. Deputy Mayor Cashmore. Aye. Councillor Coombe. Aye. Councillor Cooper. Four. Councillor Darby. Four. Mayor Goff. Four. Councillor Filipina. Aye. Councillor Fletcher. Four. Councillor Mulholland. Four. Councillor Newman. Yeah. Councillor Sayers. Four. Councillor Simpson. Four. Councillor Stewart. Four. Councillor Walker. Member Wilcox. Aye. Member Wilson. Aye. Councillor Watson. Yes. Councillor Young. Four. Carried. Could I please have that recorded? It was carried unanimously. Thank you. Yay. And now I think it's a good time to break for lunch. So thank you very much. We'll be back in just over half an hour. Oh, what time? Could we please be back at 10 past one?
coming back. Hopefully everyone had a break. We um, are going to jump to Lucy and Jenny on the establishment of the Weed Management Political Advisory Group. Uh, kia ora everyone, um, my name is Jenny Gargiulo. I am the project manager responsible for implementing Auckland Council's weed management policy. These are the eight objectives of which we um, make decisions on weed management and support best practice. So two years on, you know, still working to, to you know, continuously improve our, our um, weed management. Um, I just wanted to sort of acknowledge as well my um, a, a change since the writing of this, well it's something that um, needs to be acknowledged since writing this. Within the policy about the establishment of the political advisory group, it directly references uh, mana whenua. We do consult with mana whenua over, every, uh, over our weed management decisions, but we just want to ensure that um, specifically there'll be consultation about how they would like to be represented on the political advisory group as well. So I wanted to acknowledge that change since the, the writing of the report. Perfect, thank you. Um, was there anything else, or we can just go to discussion? Please go to cool. discussion. Um, is there any questions? Uh, I've put, um, I'll move if someone wants to second. Um, but I just want to check, so Councillor Walker has also asked if he, is there a limit on councillors on? There was, uh, there was six councillors from the um, governing body and six councillors from the local boards. Uh, Councillor Walker. Uh, I just want to raise an issue around that. Um, I don't know of any reason why you wouldn't encourage as many councillors as possible. And for that matter, those local board members that are interested to be members. My experience of the committee is the attendance often was abysmal. And even though I led out the uh, strategy in the first term of council, I wasn't uh, appointed, but I used to go along um, and often <laughs> I was one of the few people there. So, frankly, um, I just asked the question, yep. why exclude people? Uh, because essentially it, 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 it really doesn't make any decisions. It's pretty low level. It's about uh, informing yourself, if, if that. Okay. So, uh, a councillor Mahon. Well, my opinion. Cool. Yeah. So that's fine. So I'm just, um, I'm happy for if someone can't um, come that you could be an alternate um, councillor. Um, th th through the chair, since um, 2018, the meetings have been open. So anyone can attend and as you've identified, you know, the more people, the more people that are interested and, and we get to get that advice from, including um, members of the community as well as, as um, other uh, elected members, you know, always welcome. Um, the, the, sorry, it was not Councillor Watson, it was Councillor Young on there. Look, um, the last uh, committee, Councillor Walker, um, you asked to be on the uh, waste advisory, the waste levy discussion. I just wanted to see if we could give some other um, councillors a go on um, an advisory group, but I'm happy if you become an alternate for those. I can, I can get out the okay, I'm, we can debate Either this. This is the... Um, Created it? These are the people who've shown an interest to me before the um, committee, and we can discuss that in the debate. So, questions of the officers, Councillor Cooper. Um, okay. So, in terms of the appointment of Councillor Mulholland, which I support, is that useful in, because of the fact that who the part of her ward um, verges and is on the actual foothills of the Waitakere Ranges? protection area, and that's a significant area, weed-infested area that we need to keep an eye on. Is that a useful addition of having her there so she knows the area? Um, so, so we want to have a representative from you know the, the different regions as well. Just a point of clarification with the um, weed management policy that works with our regional pest management plan, which identifies the species and the locations. The weed management policy is about how we manage those weeds. Right. I guess that's the thing is for me is it's good to have people, um, and particularly new newer councillors, to get involved in these as well, and people with specific understanding of certain weed issues in certain areas. I've got a pretty clear understanding. 
Thank you. Were there any other questions of the officers on the content of the report? Uh, Member Wilcox. Um, yeah, I'm just asking, we've got mana whenua representation, what does that look like and what, what are we talking about? Oh. Uh, through the chair, that, that is what we need to be doing to understand what they'd like it to okay. look like. No, happy with that, 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 that response. Um, one other thing is this, this uh, group hasn't met, it only met a couple of times a year, didn't it, if, if I recall. Um, so my question relates to, are we just talking about weeds or are we just talking about how to control weeds? Because it says weed management, but it just seemed to be about whether to use um, certain types of um, weed killers and whether that was appropriate for Auckland Council. Uh, through the chair, um, that definitely, in my two years here, has been, you know, that is a, a topic that is often discussed. But there is a lot of community um, interest in our use of glyphosate. And even in the, the time that I was um, uh, involved in the group, there was um, international decisions and, and um, events that would um, mean that they needed to be discussed and re-reviewed. So whilst there is a large, uh, there is a, an ongoing um, need by council to, to review our use of, of a specific product, glyphosate. Within the term, we had um, presentations from biosecurity about biocontrol. Um, we had two presentations from Brett Butlin in regards to that engaging the community um, for a wider, um, for pest plant control and what we're doing with that. We had um, Paul Duffy from the local parks. So whilst that is always going to be, you know, a, a key topic that needs to be discussed, there's eight objectives and there's a, you know, 42 point action plan. There's, there's a lot more, you know, that we need to continue to get, um, you know, staff to come in and talk uh, directly to, to um, our elected members about uh, around weed management. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mulholland. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, staff. Because I am a very generous and kind-hearted councillor, and I certainly understand the needs in my community, I'm going to relinquish and then suggest Wayne Walker take my position, seeing as you are so passionate. I think that is the fair and right thing to do. Being mindful of the fact that I am anti I'm not going to be able to say it now, glyphosate. Um, I'm not anti-weed. People can choose to do what they want to do um, in the context. <laughs> but not my choice, personally. So, Mr Chair, I think that's the right thing to do if someone is incredibly passionate um, and will attend the meetings and will also lobby, I am happy to um, sit on another panel if that is appropriate and Right with you. Thank you very much. And Councillor Watson, you want to... Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Right. Thank you very much. Um, now we'll just have some comment from Councillor Watson. Um, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. And I, and I noticed that in... Points uh, 23 to 27 in the report, there's a degree of um, uh, introspective analysis of whether to re-establish the group, basically ask the question whether the group uh, should continue. Um, that doesn't quite uh, amount to a, um, a, a searing self-examination of what's actually been achieved through the group, but it, but it does at least raise that question. I think that's important. Um, it's important the question should be asked because this document, the Auckland Council Weed Management Policy, has been around since 2013. That's seven long years ago, 2013. And if you read that policy document that was no doubt produced at some expense like our other policies, it says all the right things. So we have an integrated approach to weed management, best practice, minimise agrochemical use, minimise non-target effects, public health and safety, uh, enhance the environment, empower the community, and the final one, which has been used as a bit of an excuse for 
relative inertia, um, value for money. Um, so seven years on, and the world has moved on, Mr. Chair. Because if you look around the world, what's happening with uh, the use of glyphosate, where it's banned, there's a, a whole raft of countries all around the world, every continent, Argentina, 2015, more than 30,000 healthcare professionals advocated for a glyphosate ban. France, French authorities banned the sale, distribution and use of glyphosate in early 2019. Germany um, uh, will seek an end for glyphosate use in the near future. Retail stores in, Ger in Germany have also banned glyphosate. Greece, one of the first nine European countries to vote against relicensing glyphosate. Scotland, our old friends of Scott again. Um, in November 2017, um, Edinburgh City Council voted to phase out glyphosate, um, and five of Scotland's six EU parliamentarians voted uh, in favour of a motion that would phase it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Just country after country after country that has banned or greatly restricted the use of glyphosate. But not old Auckland City, it would seem. Um, and this committee, or this uh, working group, really goes to that examination of why we're continuing, or should be going to that examination of why we're continuing to use glyphosate. And I, I guess, and I, and, I, and I don't mean any offence to Jenny, who's tried very hard and is always very responsive, there's been a, a, a relative inaction across the board for that full seven years. In fact, the only action on the ground is when I'm responding to people like groups of young mothers at a playground who, who are there and, and some idiot spraying comes by and sprays their, their young kids or the pregnant mums. Or the lady a couple of weeks ago, probably the most chemically sensitive woman in Auckland who's in a no spray zone, and she gets sprayed right outside her house where she's got a big sign, no spray. That's the only action I've seen in the ground. And in some ways, that type of incident is secondary to the communities themselves and the local boards who want to go chemical free and who are consistently ignored right across Auckland. Well, not so much ignored. They can get their parks chemical free if they come up with obscene amounts of money to do so. And to a credit, some of them, like Kai Pataki, have, have done that. The rest of them, it's not within their financial means to do that. So the individual cases are bad enough. The way that our communities and local boards, not least of which is the one I'm in, and there are other parts of Auckland too, uh, who have always been highly concerned, highly educated about this issue, who have had no improvement. In some cases, it's got worse. Seven years on, some parts of Auckland, and I'd say it's the poorer parts, they're sprayed like the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Unfortunately for those people, they don't have any representation. Some of the boards are picking it up. So there's a kind of discriminatory element at work too in this. We, we talk about the, the, the United Auckland Council. We're still going on legacy practices. So when it suits them to sell off our assets, everyone's the same there. When it comes to chemical free spray, oh, we've got to stay with what the legacy councils do. We can't move on. We'll have a trial. We'll have seven years and you're still getting glyphosate sprayed all over you. So I would say that that examination of the need for this working group uh, was very well founded. Um, personally, I've had enough of the, the yes minister type inertia. So when the, the chairman asked if I wanted to go on it, I thank him for that offer, but no. I had three years of that in the last term. Nothing happened. I've had enough of the good old boys who think there's nothing wrong with glyphosate. I'm happy for them to spray it in their neck of the woods. They can drink it for all I care. But I object to them imposing that in highly urbanised environments where people have said they don't want it. And they particularly don't want it, because you know why? Because there's chemical-free alternatives. There are contractors in Auckland who win contracts, who are chemical-free specialists, who win contracts on price, who have done big chunks of Auckland using hot water and are now progressed to, to, to hot foam. So we have parts of Auckland where it's already in operation, Mr Chair, is cost effective, ticks all those eight boxes. So my question and all the people as they're 
looking at their, their phones and with bored, resigned expressions on their faces, why isn't it getting rolled out across Auckland in this environmental renaissance that Auckland Council is meant to be experiencing? That's the question that people on that uh, reference group or whatever it's called should be asking. That's what our community asks. So it's another case, and a, a more glaring case you couldn't find, of not walking the talk. Seven years on, and we haven't progressed one single inch, because the only inch that matters is when you stop spraying our streets and our parks with glyphosate. That's all that matters. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Um, and just, uh, although passionate and important conversations, just um, language around Ho Chi Minh and things like that, just... Well, yeah. it's, a, it's a good metaphor, I think. I don't think... Well, Mr. it's Chair. an accurate point metaphor. Of point of order, it's Mr Chair. spraying it over people. Um, we just speak yeah, to relevance. Point of order. Uh, point uh, what of is order. the point of order? Speaking to relevance. Yes. Um, in terms of, are we debating the actual policy or are we, what's up here is that we should be debating who's on the committee? Um, so just point of order there that, can, yes. can you keep us to that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Councillor Cooper, I was, I was allowing Councillor Watson to talk about the, what happens within the, what the advisory group does, so it is connected, but um, yes, I'll try and keep, uh, if councillors could keep focused to the fact that this is about establishing the group for this term. Um, and yeah, I did just say around that language around you know significant death and significant um, stuff is yeah we just shouldn't we just shouldn't type ball uh, you know cool. councillor I mean member Karen Wilson. Crikey, feel a bit apprehensive now, um, but in talking to um, the resolution that's been put up there in support thereof. Uh, and specifically around IMSB and Manukino representation and taking into account what's been said, relying on points 23 to 27. Uh, policy is not everything. It's not something we're all a fan of, but, you know, Jenny is a slave to the fact that policy <laughs> needs to exist to guide, uh, and that's all I really wanted to say. We wish there to be participation because it's central to the participation of Manukino and iwi, around where to next, almost like a road map in the sense, and I take on board paragraph 23 and 25, it gives also direction, does it not? Uh, it doesn't always achieve these things, but I still have my partially excited face on in the sense that <laughs> as a new, uh, new back to the table, there has to be some lead as to where to go next for mana whenua, Māori, uh, and this is policy is intended to do that uh, in framing up what needs to be said. So I take on board what's been said, but we support the um, the resolutions there in the sense that that will involve all of those who wish to participate um, in the conversation. And as we spoke in the earlier um, resolution, drive it forward so it does work in the term that we're responsible for it. Thank you, Member Wilson. Councillor Walker. Yeah, um, so um, picking up on where Councillor Watson left off, um, the actual document that Council's referring to took a couple of years to put together, and I worked on that. I led the committee that rolled it out, and that was a collaborative process with people in the community, and I'll repeat that, a collaborative process with people in the community. Regretfully, since then, and Councillor Watson is quite right, we actually haven't moved very far. And I find it very interesting when I hear earlier conversations about a climate emergency and the like, and if you look at the evidence, we're dealing with a, a substance that's a poison that kills life, it kills bees, it kills insects, it kills soil life, it degrades and adds to the sediment um, in the Hauraki Gulf. That's the substance that we're talking about, and it also kills people. And if you read the uh, health reports on glyphosate, and it would be useful for you to familiarise yourself with them, you'll realise how it affects males and females and developing organisms. Uh, Councillor Walker, we're, we're not... Like. We, so, we are not, I'm speaking to re-establishing the Weed Sorry, Management Councillor Political Walker. Advisory Committee. Councillor Walker, we're debating who is going on to 
the advisory group. We're not debating the content uh, of... No, that's not correct, sir. The wording is around re-establishing the Weed Management Political Advisory okay. Group, and part of that also involves the constituency of it. I'll repeat, I see the words there, approve re-establishing the Weed Management Political Advisory Group, and I'm speaking to that. Thank you. And the membership. So may I speak, sir? Yes, but if you keep Thank it you. to the so, re-establishment and so I have the a, I have a, I'm just bringing some things to your attention, and particularly if I look at um, item 23, which discusses public input, transparency, obviously guidance for staff, and then I look at 25, um, it refers to public and elected members, public, to discuss Council's weed management collaboratively. And I think one of my concerns going forward is I believe that the collaboration on Council's part and on the part of this group has been poor, to say the least, in minimising the use of this substance. I refer you to the climate action emergency and the fact that here we've got an opportunity to do something that goes with that and actually does not destroy nature, but rather enhances it. So I think that if we are to put this group um, together, it needs to be much more forthright and active and target orientated in its approach, not just business as usual. And that's my concern. I'm, I'm happy to go on it. And in my view, as many councillors as possible should be on it if they're interested. And I don't see what the petty reasons are why we are discriminating in that respect. I do regard that as incredibly petty. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Philippine. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Jenny, just want to acknowledge the work over the last three years to you and your team. Um, and look, uh, definitely support the recommendations here in regards to the establishment of uh, the political advisory group. Um, I think one thing that, that we all need to, to be aware of is the fact that we get our guidance, at least from an Atamaki Makoto perspective, from the Environmental Protection Authority and, and, and what they've got. So it'll be interesting then for those through you, Chair, is just to have a look at the EPA website. I mean, I know there's others, but um, look, for me, I uh, totally support um, the uh, re-establishment of the, the political advisory group and, and, and look forward to, to options that we've always put in front of that group over the last uh, term that I was involved with. So look, um, definitely uh, support um, the recommendations, Chair. Kia ora, thank you, Alf. And we will move to a vote. Uh, all those in favour? Aye. Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Thank you to the staff. Next up, we have item 10, the establishment of the Waste Political Advisory Group. We've got Sophie in. will come and speak to it. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Team Leader Strategic Planning Waste Solutions aho, he para kore te mahi, ko Sophie Brockbank aho. Kia ora. Uh, through the Chair, I will be taking this agenda item today on behalf of the Waste Solutions Department. I extend uh, apologies from Pearl Sood, our General Manager, who is un unable to be here herself. To support the implementation of Auckland Council's Waste Management and Minimisation Plan, Council has previously established a Waste Political Advisory Group including representatives from the governing body and the independent Māori Statutory Board. I'd like to highlight an error in the executive summary of the committee report, where we have incorrectly referred to mana whenua in paragraph two, which should read as member of the independent Māori Statutory The Waste Political Advisory Group objective is to oversee the implementation of the Waste Management and Minimisation Plan and provides an opportunity for discussion and informal political feedback on key regional and national issues relating to waste management and minimisation by members and staff. The Political Advisory Group is not a decision-making entity. In alignment with the Auckland Council governance structure, all decisions on the implementation of the WMP will be sought from the governing body. 
Staff have analysed various options for the composition of this group and recommend that the committee approve option three, the re-establishment of the advisory group consisting of a chair, four councillors, a member of the independent Modi statutory board and also four local board members. Staff recommend that the chair, and environment and the chair of the Environment and Climate Change Committee as the parent committee be the chair of the political advisory group. And staff also recommend that the group include councillors and local board members that can be representing different geographical areas of the region, including north, east, west, urban, south and rural interests. We take the report as read and I'm happy to answer any questions that the members may have. Thank you. And before we go to questions, I, I before Alf, um, before Alf, I just had a conversation with Daniel yesterday. You were on the group, just making sure you didn't want to be on it or you hadn't spoken to Angela who... I have spoken to Angela and she wishes you well and she's watching this, so I better make it good. Um, Councillor Dalton um, would be very keen to be on this if there was um, an opportunity for her to serve. I'm happy to... Um, I was on it last term, <clears throat> um, but I'd be very comfortable um, to see to her if there was an opportunity to accommodate her as part of this, and I think she'd add a lot. Cool. Instead, uh, is that fine, Alf, if Councillor yeah, Dalton um, goes no, on? No problem yeah. at all. If I just say, look, I will be withdrawing hopefully under a few steps. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I did have the conversation with Councillor Newman about potential for him or Councillor Dalton. So that's great. Thanks, Angela. Hope you're feeling better. And uh, I don't think there's a, is there any questions? Sorry, uh, Councillor Walker. I was on it last year. Nobody's had a conversation with me. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I don't know why that is. Obviously, there are some things happening that I don't understand. Um, I was also on the bylaw with uh, Councillor Newman and helped to formulate the plan um, originally over some time. So I may, I may have something to add. But I asked the, the general question, why, why exclude the numbers if, if more people are, are interested? Because sometimes it's actually quite difficult to get the numbers coming along to um, a meeting. I just ask that question generally. Um, I just, it's probably, that's probably more a question of the chair. I think my experience already is that it is hard to get people to it and that's why the more people you have trying to coordinate diaries. The other thing is we need to be clear with local boards on how many we need because um, we need to be the same as them. So if we send conflicting messages. Apologies for, I um, was told that Councillor Newman was on it, but I, that was all I was sort of, um, the approaches I had. Councillor Cooper um, and Councillor Cashmore and Councillor Coombe approached me after the um, agenda went out, so I've had no discussion with you, and apologies for not going to you first, Councillor Walker, but I've been taking people who've been coming to me and assuming that that was um, the case, so thank you. Councillor Stewart. <coughs> well, I wouldn't mind being on for the East. There's nobody there for the East, and I can't see why maybe Councillor Walker couldn't be for the up top. You know, I think if... North. Up North. Um, I think then it would just sort of be very rounded and, and um, everybody's covered. And ev every, every ward's got a point, uh, can get their point across. Is there a reason why we can't do that? No, there, there is no reason, but I prefer to say with a tighter group to get things done, to coordinate diaries, to try and get six... Um, councillors and six local board members has been difficult in the past on other advisory groups and even on um, things for submissions recently. So, um, yeah, this is not a decision-making group. Everything comes back to the governing body um, or a committee to decide that. Um, I don't... Pro yeah, I, so I prefer to keep it at four if someone wants to move um, an amendment to add other members, that's fine, but at this stage I'm keen to keep it at four. Um, thank you. Yep. To the um, earlier discussion around our climate emergency and actually getting things done. 
if you want to get things done, you involve people that are interested, that are passionate. I'll put my hand up in that respect. So anyway, enough said. Um, you cannot, but I would assume that Councillor Walker is going to say he's had questions rather than speaking turn. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Walker, you need to provide wording for your amendment. What's the current membership set at? Four. <laughs> no, in, in total, I'm assuming. Ten. Ten. Well, let's increase it to twelve. Well, actually, that's wrong because we've, you've got five councillors up there, plus four councillors, plus yourself, Mr Chair, and then it says four local boards. So you already have to put up the local board to find because you've actually got five councillors. Do we, need, do we even need a, um, an amendment around the numbers? Let's just add some people. So we've got an amendment. I, I can't take questions until there's an amendment on the board, on the table. Could I suggest, are you talking for two, you're talking about five, so instead of saying four other councillors, you're saying five other councillors or six other councillors? Say six other councillors. Okay, that's, so that's the amendment. So it's six other councillors and all the wording is the same. And I presume we're adding councillors Walker and Stewart. And there'll be a, there'll be a consequential one uh, unless the members don't agree that it would also be six local board members then. Seven. Is it a question to the amendment, Councillor Newman? Yes. yes. I'll say, so Councillor Simpson first then. Um, sorry, but to be so uh, simple, but what are we trying to achieve here? Are we trying to achieve people who want to be on this but couldn't be on this in the original A, Roman numeral 2? Or is that it? Is that it? Okay, so the amendment, my question, my second question is that the amendment is just to make sure all the councillors who want to be on it can be on it. Is that correct? Fantastic, I'm clear. Can I just seek? Oh, I'm sorry. Question. Can I just seek your clarification in this amendment, which I'm happy to go along with? But the difference this term compared to the previous term is that in the previous term there was no automatic local board membership representation on this waste working party, was there? So actually, the amendment, if passed, um, brings the numbers back to roughly what they were yeah. previously. And that the additional act this time is actually the fact we're including a whole lot of local board members who weren't there in the last term. Yes, we are including local board members who weren't there in the last term. Yeah. Are these questions or are these debating the amendment? No, question, question member Wilcox. Moment. So, I mean, you know, we're putting people on willy-nilly, so, I mean, I'm just going to say this straight up. We put Mana Whenua in the last advisory panel. Why aren't we doing it on this one? And why, you know, I mean, if we're going to do this, well, let's follow the, be consistent. So Fian might be able to answer that one. Um, through the chair, one of the reasons that we haven't um, put Mana Whenua up there is um, because when we did the waste management minimisation plan, we did quite an extensive consultation uh, process um, and the the plan itself is based on a number of Māori values that are weaved throughout it. However, if there is a, um, a desire to include them in the in the group, then we can look at that and we can um, engage with Mana Whenua on how best to ensure that they are representative. Well, can we put it in then? I mean, I just want consistency here. That's that's all I'm asking for, Chair. 
So we need to deal with the amendment first. So this is that is not a question based on the amendment. Cool. And it, well, it would be to Councillor Walker and Councillor Watson's amendment, wouldn't it? Or what? Or am I putting another amendment? So you, I would, I'd like to deal with this amendment first, and then I, I am personally happy to put Mana Whenua in to my original motion. Uh, okay. There was no, it was not in the policy for this, but I do not see um, if consistency is important, okay. then that is fine. So we're going to deal with the amendment. Um, would you like to speak to your amendment, Councillor Walker? Oh, is this a question? Yes, Councillor Philip. Yep, just a, a, a question to our staff. So if the amendment goes through and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, plus the chair, that's seven councillors. Um, am, I, uh, am I assuming that the same number from the local board will be asked for as well? So through the chair, yes. If you've just seen the amendment uh, number three, we've just added six local board members. So that's the kind of consequential. Just in the... So there's two there. There's the six councillors and six local board members. Yeah. That, that would be how you do it. You balance it out. Yeah, I, I, because I know with other... And, and the one from last year, we had, we had to have... what well, not had to have, but there was a suggestion by the local boards that uh, whatever councillors we had there, the same amount of local board members need to be there. So with this amendment, we've got seven councillors, which includes the chair... Um, so I'm assuming that it would be seven local board members that would be asked to, to be on there, and then we will have a, a, a political advisory group of 14 plus um, independent Māori statutory board the and Councillor Whenua, so we'll have a board of 16. Councillor Philippine, I feel this is more of a debating point. No, 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 no. I'm, I want to make sure that that's exactly what's going to happen. That's my question. So I'm, I'm saying that 16, that's the question, Chair. Am I correct in saying that it'll be 16 members of the advisory group? That's the question. Plus mana whenua re re representation, whatever they decide that looks like, yes. That's all I want to get through. OK, thank you. L um, Lucy, did you have... It, we're probably... I don't want to bring you into political debate, oh. so I just don't know um, if I... Uh, to the chair, uh, just a point of clarification that we don't necessarily have to have equal numbers of councillors and local board members on the group. Um, that has been the uh, common approach for a number of the political advisory groups you've established lately, but I guess that is at your discretion. Yeah. Um, although, point of order, Mr Chairman. Although, uh, yes, Councillor Casey. Did I move this? Sorry. Yes, I think I did. No. Yeah, I did. Could, could I, as a mover, um, yes. just add in Councillor Stewart and Walker to the list? Um, can't. Yes. All right, everyone. We are working on an amendment. There's an amendment on the table. I'm going to have no more debate. We're going to debate the amendment. No more questions. So do I have speakers? Uh, Councillor Walker, could I please have Mr. Your, Chairman, could you rule my point of order? Your point of order. I'm the seconder of the motion. I do not allow okay. the change to the original. Councillor Walker, could I please have you speaking for your to your amendment? As one of the movers for the amendment, I'm quite happy with uh, Councillor Casey's proposal, but be that as it may, <laughs> um, just just um, speaking to it, I've I've been a member of the uh, advisory group um, for some time, I think, since its uh, creation. I was on the uh, waste management bylaw with uh, Councillor Newman, and and I think. Um, uh, some others, and I have an abiding interest in um, waste. I helped to uh, drive the strategy originally in the first term of um, council, and in principle, I think it's highly desirable that councillors that have got an interest and a passion for something be encouraged to engage with it, just as a principle. Why wouldn't you? And frankly, that also applies to local board members, and obviously they'll sort that out amongst themselves. And the same principle applies to... Um, Independent Maori Statutory Board. Any other speaker? Uh, Councillor Cooper. Thank you. Um, I won't support this, and it's just because it, 
common sense dictates that we have these advisory groups to be a smaller subsection of the committee so that we can actually get stuff done and this gets up to 16 and, if, and the local boards will want equal which would make it seven 14 15 16 17 you know it's just getting a bit untenable of course i'm not going to do my bio um but i am working with the minister associate minister in the environment on uh, through the waste advisory board so i feel like i do have a, a space there but it doesn't what but what i also think is that we've got to get our new councillors coming through doing this work that's really critical that they get an, op an opportunity. We can all go around having FOMO about not being on every committee, but you know we've just got to get practical about all of our workloads. Um, we've all got a lot of things to do, and we need to make sure we can attend the things that we put on. And I, I just think when you've got so many people, it just becomes untenable. The meetings are open. I'm sure people can come along and make suggestions, but at the end of the day, you've got to have some sort of resolution and trying to wrangle together so many people just starts to look silly, and I'm sure this looks silly, us debating it, all of this online. I won't support it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Watson. Thank you, uh, Mr Chair. And I agree, what we're doing does look silly. You're right about that. We all get, um, we get appointed to committees by the Mayor, some of which, you know, we're, we're happy to be on, others that, you know, we haven't really got any interest on but we go on because we're, we're appointed that's the way the game goes i would have thought it was cause for a degree of uh celebration that we have people wanting to go on things uh, things that they are passionate about they've got an interest in why on earth would you curtail that um and we we see it in this instance that um actually to to give accuracy to the second uh resolution of, of of the substantive motion to actually cover the north given that the chair is a as a member anyway you do need another person and if you are talking about geographic spread you do need someone in from the east as well so to actually accurately reflect those words in the substantive you do need those those six people in addition to the chair um, so the only thing that really needs to change in the amendment i guess is if you're strictly accurate is, is reference um, to to the east, so um, uh, you know th this kind of pettiness really um, really disappoints me. We've got people who want to be part of some of these advisory groups. They're going to make a contribution. We all know that people um, won't make the meetings at various times. Why would you cut people out? Why would you do that? Or is it just to be the you know, the selected few who, who, and you know, there was a degree of favoritism, dare I say it, at times there, where certain people have got the, 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 the clear run and other people don't even get asked. So let's cut the pettiness, allow the people who want to go on it, go on it, let them contribute to these advisory groups that they've got an interest in. And we've just heard from the officers, there's, there's no uh, requirement here to, to keep upping the local board. We are voting on this today, so we're taking care of the resolutions as we see it, um, and that happens to be increasing the councillors, so let it rest at that. But um, I'd urge people to, to support this and to support geographic spread, actually, to reflect what we said in the substantive. We don't pass the amendment, we don't actually do that, Mr Chair. Councillor Mulholland. Kia ora, thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you to the staff for the wonderful work. I would like to thank myself for giving up my place on the um, previous... <laughs> thank you. Uh, now, I won't be supporting this, mainly because I feel that I trust and have faith in those councillors whose names were on the board with regards to the original recommendation to undertake a fair, transparent and reasonable duty on behalf of the people in my community. And um, for that reason, I won't be supporting it because I do have faith in those councillors to do a good job. I can attend the meetings on behalf of my community. And I also want to question or ask the staff at some stage, Mr Chair, could they send me, please, a copy of attendance from the previous advisory panels, and I would also um, like to know exactly why um, there was a suggestion by Councillor Watson that they were unsuccessful. So here we are debating, you know, this matter. So that's why I won't be um, supporting that amendment. Kia ora. 
Thank you, Councillor Newman. Uh, well, yes, I, I thank myself for not me being available as well. Um, but look, <clears throat> to be honest, I, I think it's great that uh, elected members wish to make themselves available. And thank you, Councillor Casey, because I think your attempt to uh, expand the number um, to accommodate Councillor Walker and Councillor Stewart in the motion that you moved was the right thing to do. Um, for me, uh, I, I don't really, I don't really enjoy this particular work stream in the last last term, uh, but it was incredibly pertinent because it affects um, everyone, and it has a particular effect in certain parts of my ward, given some of the challenges we have around changes to the waste management minimisation plan. Uh, and the officers probably reflect on my involvement and, and just before they, there's probably an, an, an exotic adjective that gets included before my name, uh, referencing some of my contributions to some of these debates. I really didn't have anything in common with Councillor Hulse in relation to some of these matters, but it made for an interesting discussion, frankly. I think that it would be very helpful given actually that we have some massive and very expensive uh, challenges in this particular space with voting on these matters coming up in this term. It would be wise to include Councillor Walker and Councillor Stewart because you will want to try and achieve as broad a consensus as possible, as early as possible. Councillor Walker was involved in the hearings that we had in relation to the plan that was went out for consultation last time. He was a good contributor to the discussion. He has an interest in it. Um, I think it's not a bad thing. So I, I don't really, I mean, look, and frankly, the reason why this is getting so big is actually because of, of, of the inclusion of the local boards who weren't there last time. You were, if you were excluding the local boards, uh, actually, the numbers aren't that different from where we were last time. I'm not quite sure that the local board representation is essential. You can't have a local board representative who has a view of the South that is wholly shared by the South. They don't have a, con they don't have a constituency called the South. They represent one local board. We are regional councillors, so I can understand all points of the compass, I guess. But you know, there will be there will be good representation around the region, and I think that Councillor Stewart and Councillor Walker can contribute to that. So I would I would I would regret any outcome today that didn't include them in this, because if they're not included, people will make their own judgments as to why they were not included, and I don't think that's a good way to start this term. Uh, Councillor Casey. And you'll say that if people want to participate, I'm, I'm all for that. That's my who they are. Just uh, speak last on this one. So this is not uh, personal at all. Um, you know, Councillor Walker now has been um, appointed to every single working group on a submission or advisory group last committee that I had and this one, um, Councillor Stewart, I asked if she would like to stay on the weeds. My only point is that the advisory groups, in my um, experience, people don't turn up and we cannot find times to coordinate everyone's diary. My diary is full. I imagine this sits on like a Monday night or a Friday 7am at, at this moment. Um, the the idea of a smaller political advisory group is to get flesh out some of the ideas and things in a small, quick way with local boards added plus increasing the size uh, quite a bit in this, in this amendment will mean it will be several hours, I believe, longer than expected for these meetings because to ensure everyone gets the questions and answers they want to, which makes me probably assume this whole thing should just be done at this committee um, instead of as a political advisory group. So, so my it's not personal at all. I just think the idea of these political advisory groups is to get a quick look. My experience, even on submissions over November, December and things this year, people aren't turning up. For one submission uh, meeting, it was me and the officers and the independent Māori strategy um, member, um, I think it was Wilcox maybe, but so my experience is that everyone says this in these meetings and then we just can't coordinate it to get everyone there. So the fewer 
um, people together. So that's my point. This is not personal. This is, a, you know, it's great that people are, are focused on this, but it's about getting some say there's heaps of groups and advisory groups that we're all on, as well as all our committees, all our workshops and the other things we have to do um, as well. And we already know that many councillors don't want us uh, to be holding meetings on Fridays and Mondays in the city, even though many of us are here those days, it just becomes um, too hard. So it's nothing to do with anything but trying to coordinate something um, for the staff, especially it becomes impossible task in my experience. So I'll be, I won't be supporting um, this amendment. So I'll have uh, all those in favour of the amendment. Aye. Aye. All those against? Aye. No. Uh, could I please have a division on the amendment? Calling for a division, item 10, um, resolution A, numeral 2 and numeral 3. Councillor Hills? Um, no. Councillor Bartley? No. Councillor Casey? Yes. Deputy Mayor Cashmore? No. Councillor Coom? Councillor Cooper? No. Councillor Darby? No. Mayor Goff? No. Councillor Philippina? No. Councillor Mulholland? No. Councillor Newman? No. Councillor Sayers? No. Councillor Stewart? No. Councillor Walker? Yes. Member Wilcox? No. Member Wilson? No. Councillor Watson? Yes. Councillor Young? Four. Thank you. Well, welcome all the new members. Cool. Thank you. And so that goes back to the... Uh, that was carried. And that goes to the substantive... And we need to also add a D for Mana Whenua representation. Does Kathy agree with that? Does Kathy agree with that? Oh, does that, um, Kathy, do you agree that we add Mana Whenua representation? Yes. Okay. Cool, so all those in favor of the, subs sorry. Oh. sorry. Uh, yes, Councillor Philippine. Uh, now that uh, it, it's been included into the substantive, uh, my only comment is I just hope that the people that are there now don't start moaning in, in about six or seven months' time saying, look, I, I couldn't make it and everything else. So that's, that's really my comment. Uh, I will support it moving forward. Thank you. Do we have mana whenua pre yes. representation? Yes. All oh, right, sorry. Perfect. So, all those in favour of the. Aye. All those opposed? Thank you very much. On to. Carried. On to item 11. Uh, Sophie Ian and Lucy. Me again. Um, so through the chair, I will be talking to this agenda item also today, and again, apologies from parole. Um, in 2019, the New Zealand uh, New Zealand agreed to amend the Basel Convention on the Control of Transboundary Movements of Hazardous Waste and Their Disposal. The agreed amendments sought to better regulate global trade in plastic waste to prevent environmental pollution. This means the exporters of contaminated or hard to recycle plastics will be required will require consent from the governments of receiving countries before they can ship those wastes to those <coughs> countries. The amendment comes into effect in January 2021. As council collects plastics through domestic curbside recycling collections, the amendments are likely to have some impact on the council's operations. However, without comprehensive information and detail around the, the application of this global amendment, to Aotearoa New Zealand's legislation, it is unclear how extensive this impact will be. 
the Ministry for the Environment has signalled an intention to undertake consultation on the implementation of the amendment and what that means for Aotearoa New Zealand. Staff expect the consultation document to be released in mid to late March 2020 with a standard six weeks consultation timeframe. The provisional timeframes indicate, indicated fall between the scheduled um, Environment and Climate Change Committee dates. Staff recommend approval of the submission be delegated to the Chair and Deputy Chair of the Environment and Climate Change Committee and a member of the Independent Māori Statutory Board. Um, this will enable elected members to provide guidance and input into the submission, which is likely to be due before the next meeting. Uh, we take the report as read, and I'm happy to answer any questions that the members may have. Any questions? Councillor Walker. By all means, we're delegating authority, but I'm assuming that we're going to be submitting in support of the um, convention so that um, countries can exercise their sovereign right around rejecting uh, plastic pollution. Um, yes, except that we're not entirely sure what they're going to be consulting on yet, so it's difficult to say exactly what will be in our submission without the context of that from MFE. It's not so much about what's in the basal um, convention itself. New Zealand has already supported that. It's more about how that is um, embedded into New Zealand legislation and process. Uh, Member Wilcox. Yeah, look, I'm happy to second this. This occupied quite a bit of time of the last term's waste advisory political working group because we were very concerned about what was happening, especially when China closed off the door to a lot of plastics. So I'm quite happy to second it, like I said, and let's just get on with the job. But we haven't heard yet from the government what they propose to do. Is that correct? You just, I heard you. That's correct. We've just been given a bit of an indication that there will be consultation, that, that it's likely to be soon. What is included in that consultation document, we, we don't know just yet. Thank you. Does anyone want to speak to this? Mr. Chair, you, you would give direction that um, whatever comes in from this um, government around potential legislation impacts, there will be a memo circulated to all councillors around what's the, the, the yeah, detail around it. The yeah, proposed action, that'd be great. Thank you. Cool, so we've got uh, Councillor Philippine moved, uh, Member Wilcox second. All those in favour? Thank you, Mitchell. Just um, be able to introduce yourselves and your roles to the councillors. Thank you very much. On the inter-regional marine pest pathway management, preferred option and next steps. Thank you. Kia ora, thank you. Um, I'm Dr Imogen Bassett. I'm the principal advisor in the biosecurity team. Um, I'm relatively recently becoming more involved in our marine biosecurity uh, work stream uh, to provide some environmental services leadership team support into our inter-regional process and also to bring uh, my experience in the um, Biosecurity Act through our regional pest management plan into this um, work stream now that it's work, working more towards the um, statutory plan development phase. Um, it's been a pleasure to become involved in supporting this um, work stream because uh, it is such a collaborative piece of work, um, both the commitment to see um, real consistent working together across a whole range of regions and also across um, council. So I have with me today um, Sam Happy, who's our senior um, regional uh, senior um, marine biosecurity advisor in, our, in environmental services for operations, um, but also working closely operations and planning. So we've um, got Setsi Boomer from um, Natural Environment Strategy, who I'm going to hand over to to give you a really brief overview of what we're here for today, which is really just a, um, a very short procedural item. Thanks. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Sitz Bauma tāko ingoa. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak to this item. This initiative has been presented to the Environment and Community Committee several times before in the previous term, so we tried to keep the presentations pretty short. So, um, Auckland Council joined the Top of the North Marine Biosecurity Partnership back in 2016. 
This group comprises the four northern um, councils here on the screen, Northland, Waikato, Auckland and Wave Plenty, and is supported by the Department of Conservation and Ministry of Primary Industries. Uh, the purpose of the group is to increase collaboration and um, consistency between partners that have a statutory responsibility to manage marine pests. As part of a um, broader operational framework, this group uh, explored the possibility of developing an interregional marine pest pathway management plan. And Auckland Council has been supporting this initiative because it aligns with Auckland's proposed RPMP, um, also with Auckland's Council Marine Biosecurity Program, uh, funded by the Natural Environment Directed Right, and it's also in line with Auckland Council's response to sea change, the Marine Spatial Plan for the Hauraki Gulf. We have one more slide, but... Oh. So this is uh, the slide that shows the process to date. So in the left box is a bit of a background. So the initiative was, we got approval for the initiatives at, uh, through the Upper North Island Strategic Alliance back in 2017. So then at the top of the North Collaborative Working Group um, developed options for managing marine pests uh, through pathway management, which resulted in the discussion document. The discussion document was approved by um, the four no northern regional councils, including Auckland Council, uh, back in February 2019. And then um, there was informal consultation on the options in that document in March to May 2019. Um, the results of that informal consultation were presented back to councils in July last year, including the Environment and Community Committee uh, of Auckland Council. So since then, the Top of the North Collaborative Working Group have um, looked at the results, done some further analysis, and we are here and identified the preferred option for moving forward. So the preferred option moving forward is to proceed with the development of a formal proposal under the Biosecurity Act for an interregional pathway management plan that sets consistent rules between regions and that sets minimum whole filing standards. Um, so that's why we're here today. That's the middle box. If Auckland Council um, approves to proceed with the preferred approach, then Top of North Partners will uh, collaboratively develop uh, that proposal, consult on the proposal, and um, yeah, then eventually, hopefully, um, approve the final plan. Um, throughout the process, the process will follow the requirements under the Biosecurity Act, and there will be ongoing Manifesto and stakeholder engagement throughout that process. Um, there's much more detail in the committee paper, which we hope you've had a chance to read. But we're happy to take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? Deputy Mayor. Yeah, just um, some aware of things like through <clears throat> the fan wound, which has been being spread, and this was set up to have a combined effect, to have a combined approach, more a collaborative and, and region, multi regional approach. To date, has it been successful? So, just to clarify that question, what I heard. So, you, are you asking about the, sp the spread of the of the fan worm. Yeah, not just fan worm, but generally has the approach been successful in reducing the incidence? Because these things, we don't see it happening. It's a yeah. danger. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fair to say that it is very difficult to manage marine pests once they're out there. And that is, that, that's the key gap that we're seeing, that where we recommend the development of an interregional approach under the Biosecurity Act, because we don't have that seamless end-to-end. -end. Yeah. Member Wilcox. Uh, yeah, I've got a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, if we go back to your sl the last slide you showed, which um, had Manafeno engagement. So how does that go in an interregional situation? For the interregional engagement. So how so does Manafeno engagement 
How does council do that? I mean, we can manage our own, but how do the other councils manage these? And where does mana whenua engage with other mana whenua in this kind of collaboration? Yeah, that's does... a really interesting question. So I think we've, to date, Sam, correct me if I'm wrong, we've been, um, each council has been responsible for their own mana whenua engagement. Certainly we've had a lot of engagement on this issue, both through the Regional Pest Management Plan development and also through the um, our um, marine biosecurity program, um, but it would certainly be open to us to look at um, particularly where there are cross-boundary um, mana whenua that we could have a more higher spatial scale overview of how we approach that engagement. And we're really open to taking direction from mana whenua about how, how they want to be engaged in this process. Yeah, because it, it kind of, I'm kind of wary that we, you know, that we've already done sea change, which basically is a totally new way of doing things, which was interregional in itself. Mm. And I suppose I was just reading the NRC uh, biosecurity pathways in their in their latest annual plan or whatever they they do, and there just didn't seem to be the type of manafinua discussion that we had in ours. Mm. And I'm just trying to see where mana whenua here get the chance to talk to mana whenua there yeah. and okay. how that's going to happen. That's a really good question. We can certainly follow up on that. Yeah. Uh, Member Karen Wilson. Thank you. It's a similar sort. I, I'm just looking at the, because it is marine, uh, in terms of the pest management plan that's, that's there and... What are the lessons learned? We've got America's Cup um, arriving here. Uh, some have already arrived here. So what's the baseline that we take in terms of what's happening currently? Mm -hmm. uh, would be my question. We have the notion of the ports um, potentially being moved and then the specifics around locations. So as we talk pathway here, especially marine pest pathway management, there's if I can describe it crudely, there's stuff happening now that no one's taking due cognizance of, and there's some technical specialists yeah. here now. So, so that's my first question. Uh, what of what's available now, specifically yeah. around America's Cup, is going to feed into this piece of work, and then um, the same sorts of questions that have already been posed. You know, we're on marine as opposed to land, and the landscape in terms of mana whenua shifts quite dramatically. There's not a barrier, there's not a, a boundary as such. Mm -hmm. So there would need to be some lessons learned. So my it was all around lessons learned as it was in the sea change of the day. It doesn't necessarily mean the same as on land, um, but the it all will be similar. So as long as there is a pathway, uh, to encourage all the lessons learned part, and that's that. The, but my, my query is, as you're about to answer, um, around what's happening now and how that may or may not feed into this piece of work. Yeah, so I think this piece of work is really complementary to our existing biosecurity, um, marine biosecurity programme, but we know that um, although um, colleagues Sam and others are working really hard to manage those existing risks, there are certainly um, some quite severe limitations to the regulatory framework that we have to play with. And so you're absolutely right with um, the America's Cup and other activities happening. There is a real urgency to get this work underway to, to have a more effective framework in place for those sorts of activities. And I think, again, you know, you referred to, um, for instance, ports moving and that sort of thing. And that I think that, again, that highlights that advantage of having a, an interregional, really a much broader, holistic, same regulatory framework across a wider spatial area that will put us in a much better um, space than we can be in at the moment with our um, much greater reliance on a sort of a non-regulatory, voluntary kind of compliance regime. Uh, Councillor Cooper. Just, it was just in terms of the um, mana whenua Consultation, I think, speaking to Member Wilcox's um, quarter or around that, is in if you're looking for consultation, we already have the Kaipuramoana Uri, who are a very combined group of Ngati Whātua, et cetera, up there that we've been working on in the um, treaty settlement and Kaipuramoana work. So that would they'd be a good group, I think, to go to because they already are together and they're combined. Mm -hmm for that area and they work with the Northland Regional Council and the councils up there. So um, that's Tame, 
isn't it? Tummy, yeah. Tummy, yeah. There are no other questions. Are there any speakers on this? Oh, that's fine. Cool. So we have, uh, could I have a mover? Oh, do we already have a mover? No. No. A mover on this. Councillor Coombe, Councillor Cooper, second. All those in favour? Aye. Those opposed? Carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. you or to introduce yourselves and your what your role is in council for the everyone at the committee uh, good afternoon everyone um, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, provide this uh, proposed submission um, which I've got um, my team members on my right to uh, present to you um, give you a quick overview so basically um, on my right I've got Ali McNay and uh, Rebecca Ferguson uh, both within the natural environment strategy unit of the Auckland plan strategy and research department I'll hand it over fast as I can to to Ali to basically take us into the context for this uh, proposed submission and background and then Rebecca will helpfully provide a little bit more detail on sort of the process we've gone through. Kia ora tato. So as noted in the covering memo for this, uh, Tamata Arawai, the Water Services Regulator Bill, is a largely administrative bill that will establish a central regulatory body for uh, drinking water safety along with some responsibilities around stormwater and wastewater performance. Um, the establishment of this regulator is part of a wider central government package of reforms uh, in the water space, uh, particularly in the three water space, which is being led out of Department of Internal Affairs, and that builds on uh, the work that came or was initiated in response to the Havelock North Drinking Water Inquiry in 2017. So that uh, reflects the focus on uh, drinking water safety for human health. The current bill that we're looking at today is expected to be complemented by the release of a water services bill in the coming months, um, and that will provide more detail around uh, the space, and uh, there'll be wider detail on the system, uh, wide reforms to water services. So that bill will have um, greater implications for uh, council families' activities and operations, and also for our communities and other partners. So. When that bill is released, we'll come back to our committee with further detail around those implications. So for today, we're just restricting our discussion to the establishment of the regulator itself. Um, note that this uh, work stream is related to other work that's going on by central government in the freshwater space, so particularly uh, the Central Freshwater Program. Our submission here, the comments that we've made, align with the comments that we've made uh, previously on the Action for Healthy Waterways uh, discussion document. And in terms of process and developing this submission, we saw comment from across the council group, also from the CCOs, um, so Auckland Transport and Water Care, uh, and local boards, and uh, Mana Whenua and the IMSB were also notified. Um, water Care has since informed staff that they're going to be, um, or they have submitted a, a separate submission on this, um, and but their submission doesn't deviate substantially from what council is saying in ours. So that will hand to Rebecca. Uh, kia ora tato. Um, I'll just quickly go over what this bill covers um, and then go over what we've prepared in our um, proposed submission. So as Ellie mentioned, the purpose of the bill is to establish a new standalone regulator, which will be a Crown agent called Tomata Arawai. Um, this bill covers Tomata Arawai's objectives, functions and operating principles. The main focus of the regulator will be um, ensuring drinking water safety and public health outcomes throughout New Zealand um, through regulation and industry support. The regulator will have limited oversight functions relating to wastewater and stormwater networks, um, but regional councils will remain the primary regulators for the environment as per the Resource Management Act. Um, the bill also establishes the governance structure of the proposed regulator, which includes a board and a separate Māori advisory group, um, along with a transition board to support the establishment through till um, when it is established. 
So in terms of Auckland Council's key submission points, um, staff are generally supportive um, of an independent regulatory body to oversee the provision of safe drinking water for communities throughout New Zealand. Um, but we've highlighted a few um, aspects of the bill that we feel could be strengthened or changed slightly or where we seek clarification. Um, firstly, we think the bill, uh, the regulator would need more guidance and advice from the water industry and that this should be stipulated in the bill. Um, similarly, there's a need for the regulator to consider more fully local community perspectives, um, particularly considering local Māori knowledge and priorities when considering Mātauranga and Tikanga, um, distinct from any national approach to Te Mana o Te Wai. Um, there's also a need for the bill we believe to, for the regulator we believe to consider water carriers within the framework, um, as tankers supply many region, um, many households in the rural area. Um, we've also noted that where the regulator has responsibility in the wastewater and stormwater fields, um, there's potential for overlap with regional council functions. So we'd just like a bit more clarity on that. And finally, the bill is a bit quiet on costs and funding mechanisms for the regulator, and we'd like to understand what the implications would be for councils and the public. So in summary, our proposed submission builds on what we've said to central, said to central government in the past on various water programs, um, but we are broadly in support of the proposed regulator with a few clarifications and suggestions. Um, as Ellie mentioned, this bill is largely just one administrative step in the government's wider Three Waters review, and we'll come back with more analysis and advice on the implications for Council that will be a part of the upcoming Water Services Bill, which is expected mid this year. Thank you. And just one other observation is that um, the submission will go through to the Health Select Committee in Central Government. Uh, and that um, we've got an extension for this last week or so just to make sure that Auckland Council's had the opportunity to put the submission through this committee. Um, so I just wanted to note that there was just that little bit of urgency just to get this through today. So hopefully we'll be in a position to um, submit in the next couple of days. Cool. Oh, thank you, Dave, Ellie and Rebecca. Um, Councillor Newman, you have a question? A question and comment at the appropriate time. Um, thank you very much for the piece of work that you've done here. I think it's very good. Um, at no stage during the preparation of the bill and the discussion with councils have DIA even addressed at all how the regulatory functions would be funded. So it's been vague. Um, so I don't. I, I don't think there's been. Um, a proper breakdown. There's been obviously with the DIA work um, some assessment of likely costs as a result of, a result of meeting particular standards last year, um, but maybe not in, t in the context of sort of what the cost will be through to the regulator or the establishment of the regulator. Well, there are some estimates in the regulatory impact statement for this bill, um, which might be sort of in the order of 10 million to establish the regulator and then some operational expenditure in subsequent years, but um, I'm not aware of costs in terms of where they lie sort of in the regions as to how that might flow through. My follow-up question, but I do want to make a comment about this. I, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about this, and we've addressed this at Paris 27, 28 in your draft submission, but having read the bill, um, but not having been party to the discussion at an officer level with officials from DIA, Normally, a regulator, a regulator would be, I get probably part funded by the organisations that it's regulating. That's not addressed in the discussion at all from the Department of Internal Affairs. There is no indication from the department as to whether there will be an appropriation through a departmental vote for this or entity. There's nothing at all to clarify who's paying the term and upfront plus the subsequent ongoing costs. So that's my, my understanding is that there has not been that level of detail and that's partly why in the submission draft there is a question there that we're sort of putting back to central government to seek some clarification on that. Uh, Councillor Cooper, question? No, I was just happy to move, Mr Chair, so it can be discussed. A seconder? Seconded. Deputy Mayor. Uh, question, Councillor Casey. Question, comment. Um, I think we need to keep spelling out to the. If that's okay. Yeah. 
I think we need to keep spilling out to the government we're different from the rest of New Zealand and that we do have 21 local boards and I know that this went out to the local boards for comment and you've incorporated it but I think we need to spell it out it's the only thing that's wrong with the report it's just this 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 regulator this um this um piece of legislation is not for us we we've got a plus we always have had it's for the rest of New Zealand and yet we'll be we'll, we'll have to work with it and you mentioned a couple of times the need to incorporate at some stage the needs of local communities and we get our we get our um, feedback through the local boards so if you can put in just an extra paragraph at the beginning that that's how we operate that would be great thank you thank you member wilson thank you it was um very very clear for a, for a topic that's actually not very clear at all look i'm just wanting to query please um para 23 and then 31 as it as it goes through the Māori impact statement. And I'm trying to get a sense of the nature of the language. So it's, it's mooted as supporting uh, the requirement for Tomata Arawai to uphold Tamanu Tawai, and I'm assuming that's locally. And also, again, it says that in para 31. So I guess I'm, I'm sort of not necessarily advocating, but wanting to know in terms of the um, council's submission if that's a very strong recommendation or it is just supports, because it will make a, clearly a, a big difference in that sense. So there is already support said in this report, um, but I'm, I'm curious as to the submission itself and whether the language is stronger than that. Sorry, um, so just to clarify, so in 23 of the submission, paragraph 23, are you suggesting that the language we're using be stronger? And, sorry. I'm just, I, I'm just checking first question. to make sure that I'm on the right track and that that indicates 23 is an indication of the support of local, um, localised as, as w was already described, and then that's emphasised through into 31 of the Māori Impact Statement. So in the submission oh, itself, um, is I'm really checking to see if the localised views of mana whenua are, are the appropriate language is sufficiently strong to say more than I support, we support it as the submission. Sure, right. Um, yes, so I think in the uh, conclusion, concluding paragraph in the submission itself, there is the statement that localised expressions of tamana o tawai will be considered by taumata arawai and particularly the expression of Tamori to why so I think we have tried to express that in the submission sorry there's uh, in the covering paper tw 23 and then 23 in the submission itself are talking about similar things so you're referring to the submission here or the covering I paper? am so yeah. in Eastern so I'm, I'm referring to the Māori advisory group that's going yes. to be set up by um, by the powers that be and as part of the submission that there's an acknowledgement as you've you've seen um, councillor Casey's already said you know we're a unique bunch here and we would assume that would be the same for the uniqueness of the mana whenua views here so um, i was looking at those two paragraphs and trying to ensure that as part of the submission as much of the support that could be provided in strong language to indicate the localized view should be taken into consideration so uh, karen just to clarify uh, yes uh, in paragraph 26 of the um, draft submission we make a particular point of saying that the local flavour needs to come through. So um, we are trying to echo what we've said in the agenda report through to the proposed submission mm. that, that we do think that firstly, in principle, we support the advisory group, but that secondly, and, and, and also importantly, we want to make sure that the local flavour is coming through in mm. terms of how Timano to UI may be expressed. And so in the Auckland context, we know that we've had a lot of discussion about um, how that um, is, is, you know, got a different flavour to the Timano to UI in the national context. Mm. No more questions. So, was uh, Councillor Newman, you'd like to speak? Um, yeah, when you read the um, Clause 11 provision of the Bill, um, it addresses the functions of um, Taumata Arawai, and it addresses, um, you know, it talks about national level oversight, leadership, communication, coordination, it also deals with monitoring and, and enforcing compliance. I mean, enforce compliance, how does an entity that doesn't get have a funding stream to fund its operations enforce compliance? It's quite unclear to me. Um, I, the, the issue here is that uh, without 
the bill addressing the issue of how it's going to be funded and understanding how regulators usually are funded, guess which part of, guess who's going to be fund, paying for this? It'll be Watercare, i.e. the ratepayers of Auckland who are going to be doing the heavy lifting around this, I suspect. Um, and of course, Watercare um, actually has regulation, bespoke regulation that already applies to it around minimum, minimum price. Um, so I have a real problem with, and you've addressed this succinctly at paragraphs 27 and 28 of the bill. Chair, I don't know who's going to be making submissions on this matter over and above our submissions as an opportunity to address it at the select committee, but this has to be addressed because um, I suspect the vagueness is because the cost is not fully quantified, and when it's fully quantified, most regional councils are going to say we can't afford to pay for this and so most of the costs will end up back on on the ratepayers of Auckland which actually has a, a water organisation that's providing very good quality water to its communities already because it meets or exceeds um, but the real target is the other parts of New Zealand where the water quality is lower so therein lies the conundrum, and it needs to be addressed. So I commend you for the submit. I commend through you, Chair. I think the officer done a very good job, um, and the submission addresses this. But I do hope when the submission is lodged that you will be available to appear before the select committee to address this point, because how this is paid for, who this is, who's going to pay for it, um, and the equitable allocation of costs needs to be addressed at the select committee because it is touched on the submission but it needs to be fully considered at that time and it needs to be further debated before this is passed into law because um what do you say 10 million dollars i think it's probably more than that um so 10 million was the initial establishment um cost i think the operational cost annually is 50 to 60 million so, and I think um, it's, it's likely that um, as a Crown entity, they'll be seeking obviously a Crown appropriation. The question though, as you say quite rightly, is that there, there's, there is the possibility, you know, as to how they come to councils. Um, hopefully that'll be in a more targeted way. Um, but I've had no indication from DAA that they, they are looking to pass costs on. It's not to say that that's not a discussion point. So it will be passed on, make no mistake about it, this will be passed on to local government because that's what always happens, you have a regulation set by parliament, passed on in part or in whole, it will come back to us and because there is only one part of the country that's actually big enough to absorb a lot of these costs in terms of a water organisation of standard to be able to, and scale to be able to drive a lot of the work around um, development and compliance, it will be Auckland and this can't be falling disproportionately to us. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and I will discuss about select committee and presenting to it off, offline. Member um, Wilcox in the, in the debate. Yes, so I'm quite happy to support the submission. I would have liked to have seen the water care submission. I think it sends a bad, it sends a bad signal that we're kind of sending things almost in silo. Whether it is a silo or not, I think it provides a really bad signal that we're not working together. This is our own CCO. And so in that respect, I would have liked to have actually seen it in the in the report because it just leaves me wondering, well, what have Watercare said? And it also leaves me wondering, um, what have they said about the about this exactly this issue, exactly what uh, Councillor Newman is spoken about. The other thing I think is that um, I feel we need to really hammer home that we should have really hammered home the local variations within Auckland and elsewhere because our, you know, we all think we're special. I'm pretty sure Havelock North and everywhere else thinks they're special as well. So I think, you know, we just need to hammer home that local variations have to be seen. It's not one bridge covers all. So that's all of my comments and all I have to say. I'm still support I'm supporting it totally. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good comments. Thank you, Member Wilcox. I have no other speakers. Um, 
to we have mover and a seconder. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Anyone against? No. Carried. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, item 14, I think we have Kirk. Thank you, Kirk. You just um, want to maybe go through the, just a high level of what the report sure. is about, and then we'll just see if there's any questions. Thank you. Sure. Kia ora everyone, I'm Kirk Archibald, I manage energy efficiency and sustainability for community facilities. Um, for the most part I'll take that um, everybody's read the report, but um, giving a bit of an overview, um, central government's consulting in a number of areas around um, uh, changes and in initiatives, regulations around addressing climate change. Uh, the Ministry for Business, Innovation and Employment, MB, has released a discussion document around accelerating renewable energy and energy efficiency. And this proposes a range of options for reducing greenhouse gas emissions from stationary energy. Um, in Auckland, this is largely natural gas used to produce heat and um, electricity used in industry. From an Auckland Council operational perspective, this relates primarily to our aquatic centres, but also our crematorium and uh, water and wastewater treatment. For the region, greenhouse gas emissions from stationary energy are material. Um, across the region, they are about 26.6% of greenhouse gas emissions, and for Council's own operations, it's about 52% of our emissions. MV's discussion document, um, Accelerating Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, um, in our draft presentation are an opportunity to implement, uh, influence government policy in regards to, regards to stationary energy. And um, we felt it was important that we submit on this, given the significance of stationary energy on both council operational emissions footprint and also regional emissions. In some of our previous submissions on the Resource Management Act and its role in addressing climate change and also the New Zealand Emissions Trading Scheme, we discussed the need for complementary measures to the uh, Emissions Trading Scheme and the need for central government to use all available levers to support our climate targets across the region. And this discussion document speaks to those complementary measures and also government using all of its levers. And so consequently, our draft submission is largely in support of the policy options that have been proposed in the discussion document. So um, I'm interested in re receiving further feedback um, from, from the committee today and um, also um, the um, Independent Māori Statutory Board. Cool. Uh, thank you very much. I guess my first question is when I read the submission, um, which is very well written and very thorough, um, how we can expand this further. Maybe it was because of time, but I would have loved to have a bit more a conversation of the good stuff that we are doing and what we're planning and how that all um, fits in. Because I think to our discussions on our earlier item, um, so I guess more it's more a comment than a question, but if you could come back and have uh, later on and have a wider discussion about um, where council's going, especially our community facilities, is like is the um, you know a real tangible thing that we are doing and can do as a council. So, sure. questions, uh, Councillor Casey. Similar to the comment I made on the last item, I know this is a massive tome. It came in in December when the boards really weren't f properly formed, but the um, the boards haven't really had a chance to read the big document, they've had a memo. Did you get feedback from them? They said it would be attached to the submission. No, we haven't had any feedback. But um, I think in the in the report, you'll see, yes, that we um, we were quite, we had a big crunch on timing due to getting a, uh, an extension granted from MB. And so we um, we lost about two weeks of, of time to, okay. to prepare the, the memo and the report. So could, it, could I just suggest, in, in the submission, you talk about Auckland Council, sorry, you talk about Auckland Council parent and the CCOs, but you don't actually specifically mention the local boards and any green plans that they may have, and quite a few boards sure. have them. So it'd be quite good to incorporate some of that. I know they haven't given you the feedback, and I know the time was short, but it's just, again, keep reminding them we're different to everybody else. And doing good stuff at the local level too, that's the point I think that Richard's just made. We are doing lots of good stuff out there. 
You, uh, Councillor Walker. Just in terms of the um, applicability, applicability to our, you know, climate emergency stance and and, and the like, um, net metering, um, you know, effective uh, buybacks are a very important incentive uh, to enable the switch to solar or the like by um, householders and conceivably um, ourselves. Is that something we should be giving more emphasis to? And perhaps some com some commentary around the pricing around that? Because in some countries, and I'm thinking about Germany and, and the like, there's a real incentive. Sure. Um, in the submission, we have suggested that um, that those that are exporting um, shouldn't be penalised for doing that, um, which which um, is to an extent a case uh, in other parts or around the country in other network areas, and that um, anybody exporting should get at least the wholesale price for electricity. Uh, I mean, why don't we go further than that? Why don't we have the circumstance that other countries and other lead cities have that um, actually incentivise it? So you're, you've got a financial incentive to install solar and contribute to the grid. Why wouldn't we do that? At the moment, uh, the renewable, the percentage of renewable electricity in the grid is about 84%. And generally, the countries that have put policy in place around um, feed-in tariffs, so um, saying increasing the amount that um, retailers have to pay to, to buy solar, um, are the countries that are, uh, have a much lower percentage of renewables in their electricity, um, in their electricity um, supply. Um, so it's, it's definitely something that we could do, but it's, uh, it would also have cost implications. Um, so, I, yeah. So, so coming back to our climate emergency and coming back to, let's say, the preference that our city might have, which other cities have, uh, to be 100% renewable, why wouldn't we put something in to give effect to that. And sure, uh, we're not 100% uh, renewable in, um, in New Zealand, um, but Auckland Council could be, and other cities strive to be. So again, I come back to the question, why wouldn't we do that? And would that not fit with our climate emergency and the way that we're going? So I guess this just goes back to the walking the talk thing that um, constantly coming back to. Well, I think, and, and why why wouldn't we? Um, because because of the proportion of renewable electricity in the grid at the moment, and also because the um, projection for that is to increase. There's um, around 3,000 megawatts of consented renewable generation that's that's ready to deploy, and effectively that's sitting there waiting for the wholesale price of electricity to be at a point that investment makes sense. So I think if we're putting in place, um, uh, if we're making solar more viable, for example, and picking a winner there, um, then we are reducing the amount of that consented large-scale renewables that's going to be built. Um, again, coming back to our position as a council and, and the like, our um, strategy, uh, which follows on from the earlier plan, that uh, is around converting the, the vehicle fleet to electrical, and I'm assuming that we've done some work around the electricity demand for that, if we make the assumption that allied with that we were interested in being 100% renewable, quite obviously it makes sense that we would encourage uh, council, uh, in, in, encourage the, the government to have a, a strategy around net metering and a, a better rebate, because we're going to need it, aren't we? Well, um, we, we've done quite a lot of work on the, um, the business case for solar in our facilities, and there's a reasonable return on investment for it. So the, um, the, we, we've made the case that we can go ahead with that investment um, without the need for a, for a feed-in tariff. So I think it, it, the, the investment in solar based on the economics that we're seeing stacks up on its own. Okay. Yes, um, my, okay. my comment is we can be Councillor better. Walker, we're just getting into a bit of a debate here, so we might just um, thank you for really important questions and good um, answers. We might just move to Member Karen Wilson um, now. Thank you. Um, thank you. In, in terms of the uh, MIS and the power, it it's, goes to the conversation I had previously and, and endorse 
uh, Councillor Casey, and where are you appearing as in the local board and where are you appearing um, as in Mana Whenua? And so I note in the Māori Impact Statement that you're referencing, I'm assuming, Section 9 uh, in terms of benefit for, for Mana Whenua. It's not specific, I guess, because there's nothing in here, the submission, and although it's a council submission, I guess pseudo um, in the absence of, of mana it would be good to understand, given the climate change plan and the like, that there is support for those, that it's, it's obvious, it's quite specific. So you've hit on all the right points in the Māori Impact Statement, is what mm. I'm saying. Uh, what part of that, if any, can accurately be reflected as a mana view of the world, which is pretty standard and is well known within. So I, I don't need an answer. I'm just providing some feedback on where do you see yourself, and I'm talking about on behalf of Mana Whenua or Māori and a submission that comes from Auckland Council. Sorry, so was that a question in the end or, or, or feedback? I'm, I'm conscious of time, but feedback is probably all it is at this moment Thank you. Um, for you to consider. Thank you. Councillor Darby. Uh, thank you. Now, I've, I've heard the response and I appreciate um, the response on to Councillor Walker's question and I was thinking the same question and obviously I don't, I'm not privy to all the modelling on pricing, etc. that you have, but I, um, I'll, I'll take your good advice. Um, but it, it, it has been in my mind as well about or what, what does trigger the need for, you know, the buyback of localised generated energy? Probably just, you've already addressed that one, so I'll move on. The other part to that is, in this, is the need for, and I guess it links back to that question, because you're saying that there's, what did you say, 3,000 kilowatts or? 3,000 megawatts. Megawatts, megawatts, yes. thank you, that's the big one. Uh, ready to be deployed. But of course, that's likely to be uh, big generation wind farms or solar, whatever it is, um, remote from markets. I'm really interested in how we're going to stimulate microgrid systems. Um, in a resilient city, a resilient nation, you want energy, you want water, you want as much as possible close to the point of consumption. So. First question is, how does this um, uh, speak to that? And then I'll give you my second question, and that is around smart metering. Uh, like many consumers in Auckland, we've probably had the energy um, uh, distribution company knock on our door offering the really new smart meter. I'm here to put it in. And my question to them is, how smart is it for me as a consumer? Oh, it's mainly for... The, the supplier of the energy. And that's what the current smart meter is. I think we need to stress that the smart meter needs to be smart for the consumer, not smart for the distribution company. Uh, are we thinking about that? Because at the moment, they're smart for the distribution company, they're really dumb for the consumer, and they're deliberately so. A couple of questions there. Sure. Uh, through, through the chair, the... In our in our draft submission, um, we have agreed with the proposals around um, community renewable energy projects, and also emphasised that there's resilience benefits to having um, community energy schemes. Um, and for Auckland Council and our operations, that's um, specific to our rural halls, for example, that are used in emergency management. Um, and we've also recommended that the government provide more support um, to unpick the regulation around community energy schemes at the moment. Because in our experience, um, and looking at this from a council operational perspective, we found that the regulatory framework was probably the biggest barrier to community energy, um, and so we're, it's it's definitely something that we that we support, and there's a lot of interest in the communities that we engage with, as well, and um, something that we're asking for more support from central government on, um, specifically um, support for pilot projects and contestable funding, as well. Um, there aren't a lot of examples in New Zealand, and so we, we really need to build that up and get some experience. Um, regarding smart meters, um, we've recommended that the rollout of smart meters is leveraged to provide 
um, network pricing innovation, which would support renewable energy generation. And we've also specifically talked to um, the that uh, smart meters held a promise of providing better data to the consumer. And we've found in our own um, interactions with retailers that we haven't necessarily been able to access that data. So from an operational perspective, again, um, we've had our own challenges. And so that's included in the submission is, is looking to um, address both, both network pricing um, and the ability of smart meters to provide for that and uh, also the um, uh, and also improving the data that, that consumers can get. Cooper. Thank you, Mum. Just a question, because I'm just trying to find it in here. But um, in terms of moving to 100% renewable, we know that we're about 80ish, but we heavily rely on hydro. And given water shortages, rivers drying up, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is there some comments around that in here? Because you know we may not be able to ongoingly rely on that. We've got to a certain good number, and then we're relying on that. Um, we may not be able to. Is there some mention around that and discussion around that, that we need to be looking for other, probably large-scale renewable, other than hydro? Because we are pretty one-dimensional. Uh, through the Chair, uh, the, the submission talks to increasing the amount of renewable energy in general. And, and where that's going to come from is um, there's limited potential for more hydro, but we haven't um, addressed any supply risks around, um, yeah, around that, hydro. Sorry, is that, that for another time or another? I mean, that does concern me that we, we think we're pretty good, but we may not be, we can, we may not be able to rely on that source. Um, it, it was a sorry. sustainable source over time. Uh, it wasn't consulted on in the document, so yeah. Thank you. And last question, um, Member Wilcox. Yes, yeah, so I'm looking at the, the the survey or the comments, and one of them is the levy on coal that we've said. Um, I suppose I little, get a little bit concerned because in one respect, Māori are very large uh, renewable energy suppliers to the grid now, down in, the, well, there's Wharetoa and there's quite a few others in Tu Wharetoa as well. So they are quite well placed in that field and I know they there are also other generators ready to come online. I suppose, so I mean in one way Māori are already taking advantage of that, but one of the things for, uh, and in particular one manafina of a, of, um, of Auckland, and that's Waikato Tainui, is that whānau are involved in Huntley. And it's all right for us to say, yeah, put a levy on, but there's a downside to one of our, to a group of our, our whanaunga who are, who are working down there at Huntley. So how, how will we kind of, will we thinking about the social impact of that when we fill that this form, or? Well, it, uh, through the chair, um, it, currently there are levies already on um, electricity, transport fuels, and gas, to um, for efficiency initiatives and also for transition to renewable energy. So the levy on coal is really about um, levelling the playing field and making sure that there's um, specific funding stream for initiatives relating to phasing out coal. Um, there was there's some discussion in the submission about making sure that any um, any changes of regulation aren't socially regressive, so that um, we're not seeing um, any um, vulnerable communities uh, being um, exposed to, say, price in increases as a result of the um, of levies. But the the levies on on electricity and natural gas at the moment are, are pretty low. It's um, it's kind of I think from memory it's it wouldn't be any more than ten million dollars a year spread across the whole country. So we're not talking about a large individ, uh, impact on individuals. My second one, uh, one of the original councillors, uh, Des Morrison, told me that you know like Glenbrook there, where a lot of our whanau from Waikato are working, um, 
to do any kind of thing there cost millions, you know, I mean, really, blow, it'll blow out Auckland Transport. So my question is then, so how are we going to support that? If we're saying put a levy on coal, how are we going to kind of fix that up because it could almost shut a plant like Glenbrook down? The, um, the discussion document's pretty clear in splitting out um, large industrial users, and, uh, and so Glenbrook would be one of those, and also quite specific about providing support for the industry to, to transition as much as, much as you can uh, away from fossil fuels. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's fairly balanced in that regard. And in our submission, we support um, the central government providing um, more support to large industry like that that has limited ability to transition away in the short term. Thank you. And now are there any speakers to the motion? Do we have any? Mo I'll move. Second. Cashmore. Okay, uh, Councillor Walker, you'd like to speak to this? No, uh, Just one question we've got to move forward. And, and that's just around access to uh, data. Given that we've got a, a climate action plan and we need to inform it, and that's particularly around all forms of energy, electricity generation, is there any consideration we need to um, put around access to data? and, you know, timely access to data? Uh, in regard to at, at, at a regional level, say? Sure, so, so we know how Auckland is, is tracking around our electricity use, for example, on a daily basis. Um, I can't really answer that, sorry. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure how that, that process works within council, the, how the regional picture's developed. Can I just make the suggestion that you have sufficient latitude to include this in in something if um, if Alec Tang and the, the yeah. team think um, it's a good idea? We are waiting on that data for 2017. It's very slow coming from MB at the moment. So we have the ability, Alec's team, Matthew Blakey, is um, working on that. So there is data, but we don't hold the... I, I understand that. Yeah. Uh, I'm just suggesting that this is an appropriate mechanism here. Yeah. to address the issue of data. Thank you. Cool, so are there any speakers? Cool. So I'll move the motions on the table. All those in favour? Aye. 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 And against? And carried. Thank you, Kirk. That's very, very good. Thank you. Right. Item 15, and we're getting close to a quorum, so um, this is the Ford work program for this committee. This is all the information we have at the moment. Um, I guess the questions are of me. Um, Vanessa or Suad are able to assist. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, I've got a couple. Um, coastal renewal slips and remediation. Have we done anything about Urewa? I mean, I'm just asking the question because I see Whangaprawa here, but where's the Oriwa in the, in the continuing saga with Oriwa Beach? Yes. That's so the first the, one. And yes. the second one, I'll, I'll just go through the protection and restoration of Auckland's ecological health. What have we done about the... What are we doing about the trees in South Auckland? Because we identified that last year we're going to have thousands of trees or we need thousands of trees. Have we got a plan or we got anything going? So the, um, on the first question, the mention of Whangapuroa, it's the it will be the first, uh, I guess, plan or the first uh, area that will have a coastal compartmental uh, plan done, basically the first test of how we um, deal with coastal erosion, manage, manage retreat, the future of uh, things. So that will be the first um, coming to us. Sarah Sinclair. Sinclair is probably the best to discuss that with. Um, Oriwa itself is a, a, is a, is a issue that probably wouldn't come to this committee or it doesn't sit on a work program that, to that de detail and I guess it's still, yeah, I couldn't comment on that um, as a... I suppose my concern is, you know, the longer we take, the, the higher the water comes. I mean, Oriwa is just one of those places. The other one is Parakai. Yeah, the other one is Umupui at Maraitai. You know, I mean, 
I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, if we take too long, well, the tides come in, it's too late. Yep. Yep. No, definitely. That's why the work is uh, being done uh, across Auckland. But at the moment, the, the only information I have for the work program is that Fonga Poroa is coming to us as an option. The On the urban nahere, um, yes, I've been asking a lot of questions. I'm very um, concerned that it hasn't uh, progressed. For the last couple of months, I've been asking, um, you know, where that is. There is also the LIDAR data we are waiting for. It has been uh, received. It's just being peer reviewed. Uh, my opinion is that we just need to be doing the work like planting trees in South Auckland rather than waiting for the LIDAR data. But at the moment, that's the information I have. Um, and hopefully, if, uh, Vanessa might be able to comment slightly more. Just to say that we will be reporting back in May for the next committee meeting. So we'll get some more information for you then. Cool. Any other questions on the work program? Perfect. Thank you. So I'll move. Councillor Mulholland will second. Any comment? Good. Okay. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Aye. And carried. Thank you. And the last, we have the item 16, which is a summary of uh, memos and briefings. Uh, Councillor Casey will move. Uh, oh. Councillor Filipina will second. And I assume there's no comment, but if there is, no. All those in favour? Aye. And against? And thank you very much, um, members of the committee. Have a great afternoon. Oh,